Welcome, everybody, to another hour of power with demonology today. Tonight, we've got a very, very special guest. So our brief intro, folks, for tonight's guest, a uh, former educator, domestic scholar. This gentleman holds a Ph.D. in uh, counselor education, a priest and current chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Medical. He's an author of a series, a mystery series, Father Capronica. And tonight we are interviewing him on a book, a very, very important book that he wrote. When you look at the offerings out there, Ken, I mean, you, your father has, you know, just a history of all these fabulous books on the mystics and the saints and yeah. demonology and this gentleman not only takes the best of the domestic scholar, um, a lot of the exorcist, Amorth, Utenauer, and he summarizes it in a way that common people like us can understand. That's what, what I just loved about this book. Oh, yeah. His book, Demon, Demons, Deliverance, and Discernment by Catholic Answers Press, can be found on Father Driscoll's website, www.peterinchains.org. We'd like to welcome tonight Father Driscoll. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Good to be on. Excellent. You know, to bring it into tonight's show, too, I wanted to mention that we ran through the book twice, so the book is uh, worth a second read. It's it's up there with the uh, Father Portea and uh, Father uh, Amorth, you know, the two books and so forth. But I, I think it, it generalizes on more of an area which I don't really see in other books. And we ever got a book once on discernment of uh, mental health versus possession, and I didn't really find anything in there. And we wanted to touch on that again. And it, yeah, it's got all those mm -hmm. excellent elements, but besides that, you know, Father Driscoll has done something that nobody else has done, and this is what I love about the beginning of his book. Mm -hmm. He explains why he wrote the book. So, Father Driscoll, can you lead us in with where where did you find the need to come out? Like, you introduce us to there's, you know, Catholic demonologists, and you have deliverance ministers, and you have exorcists. You have all these different views. What was your focus when you wrote this book? Right. I had um, just finished my um, degree in counselor education supervision, and my dissertation was how do Catholic exorcists distinguish between demon possession and mental disorders. So I was on that topic. And um, the book then is, is uh, lighter on the mental health. So I still came from a mental health point of view, and I guess that's what made this one different. Yes. Because I am not an exorcist. I always like to say that at the beginning. I'm not an exorcist. I've uh, assisted a, a couple of pieces on, on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, but I've not, not been the lead exorcist. And so I'm not coming from that point of view. Those the books you mentioned, Portia Amorth, you know, those are the, the ones uh, by exorcists in the English language. They both in Italian and Spanish, but they're both translated in English. So mine is not as an exorcist as, as much as from mental health point of view, since that's the background I have. So how that looks, how that looks to someone who's a counselor, but at the same time, a counselor who's a priest, but more, yes. even more importantly that, a counselor who's, who's a believing Catholic, mm -hmm. because if you get someone who doesn't believe in the spirit world at all, yes. yeah. you can always write off everything. You can always find some excuse, um, write off, you know, oh, well, there's no such thing as spirits, and so here's what's behind that. So, uh, you know, it, it was good to come at it from the point of view, okay, there are mental health problems, those are real, uh, but there's also the spirit world, and and how do we kind of sort them out? Um, so that's what I wanted to go through, go from that angle, you know, mental health angle. You know, w with Ken, uh, Ken calls himself a Catholic demonologist just for good reason and I learned that basically this is how I was brought up you distinguish what makes your book stand out to me for theory and practice and assistance which we're going to get to you know in the second hour is the very very divergent paths of the narrow and the wide methods of discernment that's what absolutely blew my mind away and we're going to talk a lot more about that later so let's go back to the, the beginning of the book you really open this book with you know the the obvious, which is obvious to us, and some people who have attempted to contact priests, most priests will never ever perform an exorcism, and they probably won't need a possessed person either. Now, with every, there's so much hype, Father, in the media, and you know, you go into different cultures, you know, from Mexico to South America, Brazil, Spain, that you see possession very, very common. Do you think that here in the United States, from your research, what, what's your opinion? Do you really, really think that maybe there just is just not that much possession here? Or do you think it's a lack of trained ability to recognize the truly spiritually oppressed? Um, well, right there, Fair, you used the word uh, oppressed. 
Yes. Um, and th- that's, what I, that's what I was going to use in my answer. Um, we use the word sometimes oppression, obsession. Mm-hmm. Those are not words the Catholic Church is defined. The Church talks about temptation, on one hand from demons, yes. and then we talk about possession. But we don't talk about that kind of middle area. And it's, so those are terms that we just, they're kind of handy terms to use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just important to note that the Church doesn't define them. But certainly there's some in-between area. And so when you talk about other cultures like that, like I'm, you know, my ancestry is Italian and Irish. Certainly they both have a, a long history of, of, you know, belief in the spirit world. All kinds of them. <laughs> but I, yeah, but I tend to think that um, I'm not sure that there's more possess- full case of possession in those places. Boy, that'd be, that would be a great study to, to try and find that. But full case of possession, I kind of, um, this is just a guess, that those cultures are, are when they see problems, we're more in the United States going to immediately go, okay, that's, you know, mental health um, yes. as far as a culture as a whole. I think there are cultures out there, like you mentioned, you know, maybe South America, maybe like I said, my background, Ireland, Italy, um, at least traditionally, would look at those same problems and say, ah, spiritual problems. So, and I tend to think there's probably some of each and, and uh, in some ca- many cases, I think, are, are both going on. So I'm not sure those places have more cases of full-fledged possession. That'd be an interesting uh, you know, statistic to try and figure out. That'd be really hard. Yes. Um, but I, I do think that when there, when there are problems coming up, it could be one or the other. We're probably more dismissive in the United States as a culture of the spiritual side, and those other cultures are, are not dismissing that side. They're probably uh, addressing it. So it's probably more toward our humanistic and scientific leanings in our culture here, you'd say, probably. Right, yeah, and, and if certainly that, ha- you know, you can go too far either way. You know, you can, you can you know, the devil made me do it. You can blame everything on the devil. Um, that's going too far in that way. Or, you know, the, the church says there are three um, types of temptation, three mm-hmm. sorts of temptation, the flesh, the, the world, and, and the yeah. devil. Yes. So um, we don't want to say it's all, all temptations are the devil. No, we've got the flesh in the world, too. So we can go that too far that way, but then we can go too far the other way, which, yes, I think our culture tends to do too far the other way. And, um, narrow it all down to some, you know, science, yes. mental health, those things certainly, there are certainly those problems I deal with them, but um, they're not the only source either. So I was kind of well, gr- trying to find the, that, that middle area where we address, address both areas, yeah, yeah. Both address both problems. We're missing that here. We really, really, really are. Back to your book, I, I'm really, really curious about this. Uh, there's a lot of information based on your research, and you mentioned a study of 488 cultures, which blew me away. Mm-hmm. Three quarter of those have beliefs in spirit possession, and Yet you didn't mention in the book how these, because you are a mental health professional, how do these cultures commonly deal with those that were mentally ill? And uh, while you were researching, you know, these cultures and their beliefs in the spirits, if you came across anything about, you know, how they dealt with people that are, you know, nuts off their rockers, did your research shed any light on what they do to treat these people? Yeah, you can read a number of neat articles and some books too on on that topic. Um, and some of the art, some of those things are written more by sociologists, which I found, uh. found uh, seem to be a little bit more objective because they're interested in in society. In society, there, you know, they're looking at a certain culture and trying to learn about it, what the people there think and believe in that. Um, whereas things from the mental health point of view are tend to, are trying to sometimes too hard to categorize. You know, okay, here's what's going on. Uh, this, you know, what this culture is saying is a yeah. spirit possession, and here's how we'll categorize. It, and according to our own uh, United States mental health, you know, diagnosis. Um, so I, some, uh, in general, I like the sociologist's approach better when it came to those other cultures and um, things they would, you know, observe, things that they would call spirit possession. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I rambled there. Didn't no, I? no, no, I, that's good because you're you're about. leading you're leading right into my next question, because you know, in, in discussing these other cultures and you know how they handle mental illness. We had a, a case about uh, six months ago um, from someone that had made numerous trips to, uh, I think it was South America, for ayahuasca and have the whole ayahuasca experience. And I'm sure in your research y- you found certain cultures have uh, certain, uh, I don't know if you want to call them mind walks or, or mind expanding like, you know, peyote and ayahuasca. Now, the people like us, just take, you know, white bread people, America bread people, they're not native South Americans. They're not native Americans. Did you see in your research, uh, uh, shall I say, I'm curious about the incidence of mental illness once people who have had no exposure to these mind-altering drugs, is there a higher rate of mental illness or would you call this possession when these people come back after experiencing these mind-expanding things in other cultures? 
Well, I'm I'm uh, doubtful that that um, you know the drugs are are helping with a spiritual experience. Yes, uh-huh. I, I guess I just don't. You know, we, we and here we fall back on our Catholic faith. Um, you know, think of someone like uh, Teresa of Avila or St. John of the Cross. Yes, you know, yeah. their mystical experiences. To, to think that um, they would have gotten better medical um, mystical experiences by by drinking some <laughs> by drinking some <laughs> ayahuasca plant. Yeah, so I I will fall back on our solid solid you know Catholic faith and some of those mystic and. I just don't, uh, you know, don't see that. You know, what would, uh, you know, St. Paul's whole thing about, uh, you know, that whatever he, his experience of heaven or whatever that was, that mysterious thing he talks about, mm-hmm. um, or St. John in the book of Revelation, to think that they would have, you know, gotten a better, <laughs> a, a better ex- uh, mystical, spiritual experience of God by doing some drugs, you know. <laughs> So I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I can't go in that direction and think that those are, are beneficial. I, I think they're deceptive. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. That's so true. What about, what about the incidences of, of possibly opening up to somebody for possession? Because this is what the person had called us and thought, no, mm-hmm. it, it, it uh, just was like, sure. okay, how can you, so you do think it is I, a possibility. I'm sorry. I was going with the direction of something good. Yeah. If we're talking about opening up yes, to evil. Yes, That's, good, that's good you covered that though. Again, because they are de- because those because drugs are deceptive. Um, wasn't there, remember that song "Cocaine" by Eric Clapton, and then uh, it don't lie. But then there was a commercial later that played that song, and it said "Cocaine, the big lie." Um, yes, that's that's what those you know they they, you know, they give a, a a chemical feeling. We we know that for a fact that we can inject chemicals into us to give us a feeling of euphoria, sure. and um, so that's deceptive. It's artificial, and sure, I believe that would open up um, you know to make a door open a door, make it more likely. I mean. Full possession is so rare, yes. um, but it makes it more likely and makes that middle ground of obsession and oppression more more likely too. Um, the the exorcists. Um, it was interesting when talking to several of them that they're all pretty independently but unanimous of doors that open to you know de- demonic attacks. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, those would yes. be like uh, this this category of drugs, alcohol abuse. Um, that would be the category of, of habits of sin. You know, we put ourselves in, in habits of more. I mean, we're all sinners, but habits mm-hmm. of serious sin and embracing them as if they're good that that's a bad thing so that was one of the open doors toward uh, to, to demon demonic attack uh, another mm-hmm. one of course being a cult activity yes mm-hmm. and that leads right into my next question boy this is just like I'll tell you what did St. Michael like you know coax him or something here my next mm-hmm. question <laughs> is you know and sometimes like you know we have to kind of like go back and say okay well let's get this back you know to get the flow going this is really amazing some of the uh, cultures you know obviously have different belief systems can you share with our listening audience some of the strangest things that you found that people believe that they can get possessed by like here we know there are occasions of sin there's things that we we choose to do that are basically very detrimental for our soul what about these these cultures that you researched can you tell us a little bit about that oh uh, yes uh, for example some would say uh, well there's going to be overlap and that's one of the interesting things I found in looking at some of those other cultures really here's an example an overlap yeah, how some, so uh, yeah well here some would say uh, some of them had certain places that were either considered you know whether cursed or or whether just that's a, a place where a spirit inhabits, so stay away from it, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, so they, would, you know, they would believe maybe a person just happened to be in the wrong place, and they got possessed by a spirit, and then they bring in their shaman or whoever they have, uh, you know, to to do. Uh, some of those cultures don't make such a distinction between a medical physician and a, and a spiritual person, and so that would come in and try to do some kind of a I don't know, drive the spirit away if it's an evil one. And um, so we've got that. So that's oh, that's bizarre thinking of a certain place. And yet, you know, I mentioned temptation. And possession is two things the church, you know, certainly, you know, we believe in. Yes. Um, but then there's also chapter three, of, as we call it, uh, the third part of the, the rite of exorcism mm-hmm. is actually for a place. You know, yes. uh, the first part of that rite is, is the instructions, and the second part is the rite of exorcism itself or a person possessed by a demon. Then the third is if there's a particular um, place or, or even thing mm-hmm. that um, seems to be under, you know, strong demonic influence or attack. And um, so there we kind of believe in it, too, at a certain place. And generally we're thinking haunted house, you know, yes. that a, a house would be. But um, I'm, I'm in Illinois, and I'm trying to remember if it were a year or two ago, um, when uh, sometime in the last couple of years, the state passed a, 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 a homosexual civil union law, uh, mm-hmm. you know, providing for that, and then yes. within a year later, it was, you know, it was for homosexual marriage. Well, is that one, I can't remember which of those, but uh, Arch, uh, but Bishop Paprocki of, of the other Springfield, Springfield, Illinois, yes. um, he uh, announced in advance that he was going to do this, and on the 
the day the governor signed whichever of those bills, I can't remember, one of those bills, um, mm-hmm. he did Chapter 3 of the Rite of Exorcism because he said what, this, they, this is a location, according to the church, this, that Chapter 3, they call them the prayers of Leo the Thirteenth because he added them. Um, yep. And therefore a location under a demonic attack. And Bishop Paprocki said, well, guess what? I'm, I'm Bishop of Springfield, which is the capital of the state of Illinois. <laughs> I see it's under attack. I'm doing this ritual. And of course the media made fun of him, showing their ignorance because they're saying, oh, the state is possessed. No, it's not no, what he said. No, this is a place. This, yeah, this demonic attack, and here's the purpose of this. I never would have thought of that. I'm thinking of a more particular place, but, yes. he, you know, he was thinking on broader terms. You know, God bless him. Good for him. Wow, what a, that's that's some bravery. I, I We know somebody, uh, um, my mom lives in New Mexico. We know somebody that is constantly, he's made fun of and derided constantly in New Mexico. He is a very, very well-known priest, and he takes his parishioners right in front of Planned Parenthood buildings, and he says Mass right there, and he'll do minor right prayers right there, you know, with permission, of course, from his bishop. And a lot of people deride him and make fun of him, but he's obviously having some impact. And, you know, mm-hmm. what 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 you're saying about the place is very, very important because Ken and I had talked and last year, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, there are many, many, many programs which are very, shall we say, not completely honest with people, mm-hmm. where they're coming from, um, what the realities of uh, spiritual attack, um, demonic attack, where it's coming from. And a lot of times you might have something going on in house that, you know, a priest can come and pray just and sprinkle some holy water without doing, you know, the the um, level three right. Well, last year this event caused a, a big to-do. It was definitely a money-making event based on an actual Catholic exorcism, a young boy. Um, and they were going to have, I don't remember how many team members, Kenny, but this was yeah. the, what was it What was it called again? It was the... the exorcism um, Alive on Destination yes. America. Can we talk about that for a minute? And we took a strong stance, Father, and said that this is, this is really, really not a good idea to stir stuff up where nothing exists. But to say the least... And our own uh, diet, well, not our diocese, but our um, St. Louis diocese yeah. came out and archdiocese, archdiocese yeah. you know, came out and said that uh, there's no evidence that this needs an exorcism. Do you remember that that one that came out, Father? Yeah, on, that was on television. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was uh, um, it was not a, a, a Catholic priest. It was a breakaway. You know, one of these small. That's a whole other topic, isn't it? But historically, there have been a few you know breakaways from the Catholic Church and yes. the claim to still have apostolic succession and claim to be valid bishops and priests. was It, it was one of them, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Like and that's what I yeah, wanted to ask well, you about because a lot of people are always asking us, well, you know, how do we know if somebody's got valid succession? How do we know if they have the faculties and the succession, the apostolic succession to perform a house blessing? How do people figure that out, Father? Hold that thought. We'll be right back with some more demonology today after these commercial messages. This is Kenneth Deal along with my wife, Farrah Rose Deal, and we're going to talk to you about, real quick, about our books. We have five books available right now and one on deck. The books are The Catholic Demonologist Handbook along with the Workbook and Study Guide and The Christian Demonologist Handbook along with the Workbook and Study Guide, and that's for all denominations. While we also have the Haunting Self-Help Guidebook. Any and all of these books are going to help direct you to not just the natural causes prevention, prayers to assist you, to keep you and your family protected. Yes, real solutions done by real people in the field. And we're sharing our knowledge and information to help you help yourself or help a friend or a client if you're in the field yourself. www.sorgesaintmichael.org or www.catholicdemonologist.com. You can buy the books direct and get them personally signed. Welcome back to Demonology Today Radio with Father Mike Drisco. And the question that Farrah was asking was about apostolate succession. How do they know these uh, self-proclaimed priests? Do they have apostolate succession and do they have the faculties to perform exorcisms? Well, that that should be pretty. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. You would think, even though we have, I, I think so. We uh, you're we, Catholic. Our, I'm Catholic, but a lot of people don't know, and they're scared. Well, okay, you're right, yeah. right. That, that's thank you for the correction. Yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> we take it for granted because we were smacked in the cradle is Catholic. Is call the bishop. <laughs> yes, call the bishop. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. You're right. Um, because 
I mean, look at it this way: we have our split with the with the Eastern Orthodox, and yet it's still very clear to uh, you know find a, if I want to find an Eastern Orthodox validly ordained priest, I'd mm -hmm. have a pretty easy time of it. You know, I'd find out where you know the nearest one is, and you know, find out who the bishop, is, you know, the Eastern Orthodox bishop, and and ask him. You know, it, it's not it's not a huge obstacle to try and find a validly ordained priest through through a, a through a um, you know a, a bishop and author a, a real yeah, bishop. Father, um, can I ask you a question now? Yeah. The, the, you yeah. talk about the separation, you know, the 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 great schism over the philoque. Are they they're still considered though valid valid uh, Catholics? A correct. A absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. You. That was my point with them that it's it's easy it's still easy to find the apostolic succession by you know and even though even though Eastern we Orthodox and yes Catholic. And, okay, and the, good. And the, and the Roman Catholic right and all well even the Eastern Catholic you know but yes that's my point that it's very easy to find even in Eastern even here in the United States where there are not so many Eastern you know Orthodox but it still would be relatively easy to find one with valid orders so when you see as soon as I saw something like that that, that was going to be on TV I was like okay I, I, I would have put up a large amount of money this is not going to be a Roman Catholic and it's not going to be a valid Eastern Orthodox either because they're not yeah. so silly either yeah. you know and so it turned out to be some you know someone from a breakaway sect so you yeah. know it is what it is I, there's no we don't have any <laughs> we don't have an inquisition so anyone who wants could put on a collar and sit, call themselves a bishop and, and maybe get on TV you know we yeah. don't have any way of stopping that you no know, and that's what people what, what people are so angry they're like why can't the Catholic idea. Church stop them why can't the Catholic Church say anything to them it's like well what's the point they want to believe this is America <laughs> and even well, in yeah, Italy no, we have no control over that guy yeah wh no. whoever he was he wasn't a yeah we, he's not under the authority of any bishop so uh, yeah. nothing we can do about that other than make a statement as they did saying this has nothing to do with us I've been yeah. watching Bob Larson for years oh please and not we in have a good to go way there. of course oh mercy using him as a, as a poster boy for an example of abusing you know a title or you know calling an exorcism when it's not or calling it a possession when it's not and he uh, he filmed a documentary which it seems like it was available for free a little bit and it was like three and a half hours and it goes on and on and on it's just, he goes to the vatican has his camera crew follow him there after he did that when he came back he started wearing a roman collar he used to be a suit and tie guy like your typical other other denomination you know kind of thing and then now he just wears but he still holds up the plain crucifix you know and it's funny because that's not even in the other denominations they don't have anything about sacramentals even using the bible as a sacramental there's nothing to be said except for, the, you know, the apron and the, and the King James or whatever. <clears throat> um, but uh, there's a lot of that going on, and the church is uh, calling it, uh, calling them robe mavericks, um, you know, the schisms. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so many words for it. You no, know, I don't have a, the, a, a documentation. I wasn't, I didn't look that hard for it, but again, not being an mm -hmm. exorcist, but talking to a couple of them. Apparently, it's okay to um, do an audio recording uh, of an exorcism for only for the exorcist's own, you know, personal use to listen to to it because I could see how that would be helpful in between sessions. Um, but they are not, so according to what I was told, like I said, I didn't see the documentation from the Vatican. Maybe, mm -hmm. excuse me, maybe it's even just their own bishop's rules. But anyway, a good rule that they said they should not be video, video, um, even even in private. And I think that's a very good rule because who knows, one slip up and that gets on YouTube and oh you my know, gosh. We, want, we want to always be able to, we want to always be able to say, hey, this is nothing to do, you know, here's some guy in a collar on, on YouTube. But, you know, we look up his name. Nope, not Catholic priest. You know, wow. we want to be able to say Say that, where otherwise it's going to be too sensational. That's my understanding of the history. Again, that wasn't mm -hmm. my um, was was not my focus. Uh, there's a, a, mm -hmm. a Father Grob who did a great uh, dissertation on the history of the exorcism ritual. But that's mm -hmm. you know back. Really, Fa in the can early we days. have that? Can we have that name again so you know we can share that with yeah, the Father, Father Grob? Father Jeffrey Grob did. Uh, he's a priest of the Diocese of Chicago, and he did a, a dissertation, a canon law dissertation on the history of, of the development of, of the rite of exorcism. So it goes back, starting of course with the exorcism of exorcisms that Jesus did. Wow. And, and how do you spell his last place. name? G-R-O-B. Oh. Okay. Oh, Sounds okay. familiar. Yes, it does sound familiar. Back yeah. to your book. We want to talk to you about talk about your book because everybody just loves your book. The people who have oh, read it just well, you know, it, it's hard yeah. not to. You know, if I was wanting to be Julia Childs and I had a how to cook like a dummy but be look like Julia Childs, <laughs> this is the book, okay? <laughs> this is the book. If, if I have no clue, you know, and, and somebody says, Well, you know, we'd like you to help, you know, on our prayer team and you need to learn 
learn about deliverance and exorcism, this is the book I'd want to pick up. Oh, well, thank you very much. And since you're paying me a compliment, I want to pass it on to, to uh, Catholic Answers, the publisher, and uh, Todd yeah. Aglia Laurel and the others there who helped, uh, who edited. And uh, it definitely was a, I, that was an experience. I'd never, this was my first book, you know. Really? Of, I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah, because I wasn't an author. I was a, coming from the academic side. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I've written papers and things, but as far as a book for popular, so I had to get used to, um, as we were right, as I wrote it and submitted it, and he says, oh, yeah, this is fine. And then he starts editing, and I'm thinking, well, wait, it's fine. Wait. Don't touch my book. <laughs> Don't touch my so papers, I had to, Yeah, I had to learn not to, um, you know, not to be too attached to any given sentence or paragraph or even oh, chapter. Yes. And to keep in mind the big picture, and the big picture is it's a much better book after having the, uh, you know, the editors at Catholic Answers uh, work wow. with me on it. It's a, you know, even though there are parts I think, oh, I should, they should have left that, they shouldn't have done that. Uh, yeah, that's going to be differences. The fact is, much better book after after having them uh, go through it with me, and we go back, went back and forth, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, definite improvement. So thank you for the compliment, and I pass it on to Catholic Answers. Mm-hmm. Well, wonderful, wonderful. Like I said, we got to get back to your book. There's so much stuff in there. Mm-hmm. You know, you made a point because we have a lot of people that look at. Um, you know, exorcism is a mystery. They look at, uh, you know, demonic oppression, demonic possession is something that either they just can't possibly imagine. Yet the Bible gives us certain outlines on, on what to look for. And you definitely, the first thing I just noticed you hit right on the head, which is funny because I hadn't really thought of it. You know, I learned other ways other than looking at the Bible. You pointed out about the Jezerine Jezer, uh, demoniac and what we learned about some of the signs of, you know, that can show demonic possession but do these sh- the signs of the Jezerine demoniac do they actually mimic in any way shape or form mental illness yeah um one of the things um the, uh, the in my mind that you know there are the three the, the right of exorcism gives three um three signs of, yes. of demon possession um facility with an unknown language meaning not just kind of babbling but a person actually speaking the language they should not know or understand and or understanding it when when the exorcist speaks it mm-hmm. um so that's one um knowledge of hidden and future events is the second one so the demon might say some tell the priest something about his past that there's no way this person you know sitting in front of them should know um and then the third and so those can be pretty clear cut. I especially like that, you know, the, the, that second one, how would this person sitting here know something about my past? If someone does that, that's beyond <laughs> nature, clearly. Yes. But the third one, I think, is a little bit tricky, and that's a great strength. Now, the, the biblical description seems to make that pretty clear. It's almost, it almost doesn't matter because, you know, Jesus knows if the person, he didn't, Jesus didn't have trouble discerning, <laughs> you yes. know, uh, possession. Yeah. He knew. <laughs> we, we, we don't have that, you know, power, so we have to try and look at these signs. Um, but anyone who's, uh, I've been a hospital chaplain for uh, a little over 12 years mm-hmm. and, and also on the mental health side of things. But anyone who's worked in an emergency room for a few years or a mental health unit has seen um, how how uh, when, you, when you have a person not in the right mind, mm-hmm. even if they're small, but if they don't care about hurting themselves or someone else because they're not in the right mind, it's amazing how many people it can take to hold them down. Yes. We don't want to look at that and say, oh, look at that, they're possessed, they show great strength. Precisely. Well, maybe, but yeah. maybe they're just not in the right mind. And once you disregard your own safety and that of others, a human being can be a you know scary thing. Um, mm-hmm. So that one can be a little bit um, difficult. But anyway, that one was one of the signs in the in, at the Garrison demoniac um, mm-hmm. was great strength. And once you start talking about like chains and things, it, it sounds like the Bible's describing that's pretty. So that, I've never seen that. That's getting pretty extreme. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's like Samson. Signs of great strength, I think it should be noted as. And uh, you remember that when someone actually passes out, mm-hmm. it seems like they weigh like three times more than normal because when they just drop, I don't know. <laughs> right, that dead weight, yeah. Um, and another thing maybe um, with Gerasene and with a number of the one the exorcisms Jesus did, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the um, knowledge of hidden or future events, uh, hidden knowledge, how would they remember how they would scream out, you're the son of God, and um, didn't the Gerasene demoniac come up and do a homage? How did, how did this guy who's you know um who's never seen jesus never been around him suddenly you know here's jesus and he spots him immediately well it probably was not human knowledge it was probably the yeah. demonic knowledge manifesting yeah. right there and so how many bearded apostles times. you know that he would stand out like that that's rather assumption it's not like he's that uh, uh, jesus is always leading the pack like the geese you know in the v-shape with him in the front and it's so obvious even judas had to point him out by walking up and giving that, that kiss on the cheek portrayal you know because uh it was would you really know jesus is he's wearing this gold garb or something like that well yeah I, that, that's that's a good point 
that you make there. You know, that, and that's a great point you make. You know, how do you describe? Well, maybe average height, brown hair, beard. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's a, a lot of people look that way. So, um, you know, the, and without, uh, we, we, I think that's a great point because without media, without, uh, you know, now we're so used to everyone's picture all over the place. Yeah. But um, like you said, back then, yeah, even uh, even just to identify would would have been, uh, the, when Judas had to identify Jesus just because they're not going to, never saw a picture of him and if they hadn't seen him in person, they wouldn't know what he looked like. Yeah. Yeah, so that, those are a couple of signs that look like garrison. And then the in, interesting there, uh, the, the way that concludes, um, remember we were talking about part three of the rite of exorcism, um, mm-hmm. a demonic uh, you know, attack or attachment on a, on a um, place or thing. Mm-hmm. A thing, um, uh, a- animals count as things in that regard. You know, they're not, you're not going to do a, the, the, the main, uh, you're not going to do the rite of exorcism. On a, mm-hmm. We're not going to call it possession if it's an animal yeah. it's, mm-hmm. because they're not human. Possession is specifically talking about human beings. So that mm-hmm. would be part three. If you're going to try and uh, the animals can become possessed, as bizarre as that sounds, there it is, right in the gospel. Um, yes, so the pigs. You, if, if uh, there was an animal that seemed to be possessed, uh, and from my talk conversations with exorcists, they think that's extremely rare. But you could do uh, chapter three, yeah. which, by the way, that part three of the right they keep talking about, that also um, requires the priest to have the bishop's authority. So that's you know that's not something the priest, according to the instructions, that he's not supposed to just go and do on his own. But mm-hmm. so when you talk about house blessings, that's the proper thing. If I someone sees see something weird going on at their house or hears things, you know, oh the priest should give us a blessing. If he himself sends, you know, can witnesses to something beyond nature, that's when he should, you know, report to the bishop and see what the yeah. bishop wants to do about it. What you said about the animals is an, another interesting point, too, if you think about it. Okay, he he told, you know, basically send the demons he cast out, going back mm-hmm. to that same thing, into the pigs. Now, and I was just thinking about, hmm, how many cases of animal possession, they can be affected. Animals can be given illusions just like humans. You know, they bark and eat air and haunted houses and that stuff they see something or sense something that we don't see uh, they could be manipulated they can have you know they they may look at you and see not you and then attack you you know like they i think the end of the old amityville horror with margot kidder had him fall into a well and their dog uh whatever harry didn't recognize him and started going at, and he's trying to get out of the well because he was all covered with black now, I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot of ways to manipulate an animal that we, without, and, you know, we can't assume that they have permission to go in and possess it now unless some sort of ritual or, you know, are done. Yeah, I can see that. I think that is rare. Um, influencing it should be easy, um, just like it is when they um, they might actually, uh, we've heard of this and seen it uh, when they have some sort of, like, um, sleep that's unnatural. They won't wake up for nothing. And other times, they're the only ones awake, experiencing something. You wake up, and then you hear the dog barking, and you go down to see what it is and it's barking up the stairs and nothing you know that kind of thing so yeah i think the possession case is kind of kind of a rare thing now that i'm thinking about it well, you know and with that um, they're not possession case at, but similar right yeah the kind of infestation as they usually call it um if we're thinking of why would the devil do that it's not because he's uh, going to cause the animal to go to hell or heaven you know yeah. so um so what it, it, it is uh it, manipulate was the word you used that's a good word for it so the purpose has to be to kind of mess with human beings mess with the animal in order to, what's the end result, you know, what's the goal of the devil to mess with human mm. beings? What, what's the goal of all this haunted, you know, stuff? I call it nonsense, even though some of it, uh, I've not seen anything that I thought was unexplainable or heard anything I thought was unexplainable, but enough people have told me that, yeah, I, I certainly believe those things happen, but what is what is the devil's end game with that? Distraction, get people watching Ghostbuster shows rather than saying their night prayers. <laughs> you know, it's, I think it's that simple from the yeah. devil's point of view. Yeah. If he can get more people watching those and fewer people receiving sacraments, Hey, he's, you know that's the that means toward his end of dragging people to you know getting people into hell. Ignore their faith and and mm-hmm. get distracted with nonsense. Like someone I talked to recently was talking about a couple of things in the, in the house. Maybe uh, you know feeling some some you know more than just feeling a presence, like someone physically touching them. A couple of family yeah. members and yeah. and when, when no one's around and maybe some something moving slightly. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, you know, let's talk about your spiritual life and, and make sure that's on track because the things you describe, if those are indeed demonic, to think about that. Uh, you know, a chihuahua can brush against you and, and pull a blanket. You know, that in itself isn't anything to be afraid of at all. <laughs> what freaks people out is, oh, you mean that that was a demon? Well, that should scare us, but not in a Ghostbusters type way. It should make us think about well, what am I doing to avoid the occasions of sin and and um, what am I doing to stay in a state of grace because... Mm-hmm. The, the devil can't brush against me and then, you know, like a, like some cool movie that might be where he then drags me down to hell. Well, that doesn't happen in real life. Going down to hell means 
committing mortal sin and being unrepentant. So you know what I mean? Those other things yeah. are such distractions. One exorcist uh, used the phrase um, cheap parlor tricks. He said, yeah, when you're doing an exorcism, he said, yeah, it scared me at first when, you know, electrical thing. And I've not seen this, but he said, you know, electrical things going on and off, objects moving. He yeah. said, but after a while you're realizing that's really, that's all, you're the prince of darkness and all you can do is flick a light switch mm-hmm. or, or, or rattle something. I can do that, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's the devil trying to, as he said, cheap parlor tricks or, yeah. or another one caused it, call, another exorcist called it noise and distraction. Mm. And as I think about that and thought about it, like, yeah, that's right. Here he is, Lucifer, and all he can do is, you know, rattle something or, or move an object, move a cup and tip it over, really. Um, mm-hmm. No, he can do much worse than that. That's his distraction. Yeah. He can tempt us and, and you know, we give mm-hmm. into that enough and, and mm-hmm. unrepentant we end up in hell. So this other stuff is just nonsense. Um, either it's imagined or if it's real, it's still nonsense coming from the devil. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the hard part, <laughs> is determining. Is it mental illness? And is it the devil? What can demons do, Father? And what, what are they not allowed to do? Um, the devils cannot read our minds. Only God knows our mind and you know, our, our heart and our, our minds. So only God can do that. But um, demons are you know, fallen angels, and therefore they, they'll have their, their natural abilities, mm-hmm. um, which are very great. Intelligence is one. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, just think of the nature of a spirit, okay? Very, very great intelligence because it's just infused. They don't have to study. They don't yeah. forget, you know. Mm-hmm. And they've been around a long time since the beginning. Um, time passes differently for them in the sense that um, they don't feel like they've been around. They don't feel like, wow, I'm getting old. You know, they don't feel that way. They're, <laughs> you know, they're purely spirit. And celebrate birthdays. So, yeah. So the point with that is, and, they're very, and they can observe things and remember everything. So, you know, let's say you've got a couple who, you know, married couple or whatever, two people who know each other very well through the years. They can, you know, read a lot. You know, hey, what's wrong? I can tell there's something wrong with you. Just by the slightest thing, we might not even be able to tell how we knew. Just slight little things and voices voice and face and whatever, whatever we can do, you know, the devil can do in space because he, he watches, he's smarter, he doesn't forget, you know, and so they can make it look like they're maybe reading minds, they, they can't, but they can make very good guesses as to what we're, you know, what's going on with us, uh, just like a person who knows us very well. So there's, there's I guess, one, one of the things to be aware of with the devil, um, and they a get lot, around a lot. A lot of mentally you know, ill people they, think that, the, that their minds can be read. Time to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with more Demonology Today Radio. Are you looking for something special to remind you what a mystical experience prayer can be? Are you looking for something beautiful to hang in your car for protection? Try Prayers by the Bead. You'll find a variety of original, one-of-a-kind Anglican prayer beads, Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic prayer beads that are made to your specification using our materials or your materials made to order in just about any design that inspires you to get prayed right up. Vera has about over 100 in her inventory pre-made. And guys, yes, there's plenty of rosaries and designs for you to give to your father, for yourself, for your own prayer life. We have a variety of exorcism medals, including the St. Benedict cross, beads, anything for your spiritual warfare needs. So, if you'd like some more information, find my page on Facebook, Prayers by the Bead. www.etsy.com slash shop slash Farrah Rose. Or on Facebook, Prayers by the Bead. Welcome back to Demonology Today Radio. And speaking, Bear, you were last saying that a lot of mental people think their minds can be read by these demonic spirits. Father? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to find like the people who are, you know, with, with some paranoid schizophrenia that um, kind of the big, in my mind, the kind of the big three, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the scary big forces out there um, would be the <laughs> devil, um, aliens, and the government. You know, those are three <laughs> categories. Oh, my of, of gosh. Oh, oh, I, and I don't mean that as a joke at all because these no, no, are people no, I see every no, day. No, you no, know? it's so not. Sounds, it's not a joke. I'm it laughing funny. because you just described two clients but, that we had from Colorado and California that it was the government and what was the other one? It was aliens. Yeah, aliens. Yeah, yeah. And it's because just because those are all big unknown things. Hey, believe yes. me, I, I, I it's, it's not funny. <laughs> They're scared you know? to death. Um, 
And then they're so right. frightened. Mm-hmm. And I wish we could help yeah. them. And there's enough yeah. material out there to kindle it, too. Yes, there's plenty of material that yeah. feeds the fire. So, yeah, and, and so now sometimes, again, the same people will be saying that, you know, they ha- they're having dreams about demons and things like that. The, the devil is a, I was going to use a colorful word, he's a bad guy and yes. very cruel. And oh, yeah. so who would he like that we'd say, well, that would be a really horrible thing to pick on someone who's schizophrenic and paranoid. Yes, it would be. Therefore, it's the devil's, you know, is exactly who he's going to like to um, attack because no one just because he's mean, you know, he's cruel <laughs> yeah. and no one will believe this poor person. So um, I make sure, you know, if someone tells me that, oh, well, you know, let's, uh, let me say a prayer and, and we'll sprinkle holy water. And, yes. you know, so we do that and talk a little about the spiritual life. And then I say, OK, now, you know, you're because the person knows they're on a mental health unit when I'm talking to them there. So, OK. Well, you're here on the mental health unit. You must have some, you know, emotional or mental struggles going on. It could be part of that too. Are you, you know, are you talking to a counselor? Are you, you know, doing some of the, talking to a doctor? I want to make sure they're addressing both sides of it because it could be one, could be the other, could be both. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't want to neglect the spiritual side, but I don't want them to neglect the, you know, the the other aspect too. Mm-hmm. That's what we when we talked about the Gerasene demoniac mm-hmm. at the end of that episode, one of the Gospels. You know, it's in Mark and Luke. I can't remember which one of them says. Um, at the end of it, it says he was sitting there saying. And I thought, oh wow, sitting there saying. He may have been both that we know he was possessed. He may have also had mental health problems, and, and Jesus, you know, healing both of them. At least that one word implies that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, you know, we might even see an example of that in the gospel. Yeah, like damage, yes. because if you if you have oxygen denied to your brain for some reason, and that can happen from you know some drug or whatever causes brain damage, and uh, we don't, it can put you in something like a semi dream state. I I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. You probably have the better word for it, obviously. And uh, and then I, when I was younger, I used to think hmm, maybe. It explains these guys in L.A. and stuff walking down the street and talking to themselves, you know, instead of just something so simple as paranoid schizophrenia. Maybe uh, they had that kind of brain damage from Timothy Leary LSD experiments, and it did kind of permanent damage. Whatever that drug subdued in their brain or excited, maybe it did permanent damage because they're that way 24-7. Well, now that we're in the war for uh, over 30, 40 years here, we uh, obviously have a lot different opinion. Not that the devil made me doing everything, but we have to consider that heavily just as much as we do the psychological or the environment and all these elements. And that's what's that's what's difficult to gang all those together. And that's why we're picking your brain on the on this show. We don't get too many people. We had Adam Bly once on the show who mm-hmm. uh, working with the bishop, and he came around uh, about 2006, the first time I ran across him. And he was just taking, uh, you know, I think his... Um, his studies was in mental health in particular, and not so much yes. theology. And I think, I, you know, I was like, I went looking forward to picking his brain for some reason. Didn't quite get that information that we wanted to, as, as such as even your book yeah. has revealed, because I think it's an important thing to know, because some people call the diocese and um, us, yes. and then that's the big question. Is my daughter mentally ill, or are they possessed, or in some cases? Is, and that's a good yeah. one. How are these families, Father, how are they observing signs that mimic possession in their children. What well, what are these signs of mental illness that they're missing? Well, see, I I tend to think that the signs that mimic mental illness are again more of those middle level obsession oppression. Ah. Um, but full possession, if we and and that's where you you mentioned uh, you know rightfully so the the difference between kind of the wide approach and narrow approach. Yes. Point of them. Um, the the right of and and those are both legitimate in, in the right of exorcism. Mm-hmm. Um, after naming those three signs, the yes. right then says and other signs that the exorcist used to build up the evidence. And it doesn't say what those other signs are. Um, that's kind of by experience and judgment, you know, of, of the exorcist. Um, but I, for full possession, I guess I'd want to see, and most exorcists, no, I can't say that, I'll, I'll, uh, some exorcists are in agreement with that. Yeah, show me the money. Show me one of these dramatic signs. Um, other exorcists would say, no, no just if I, if I see other things going on, um, you know, uh, the reaction to the sacred, um, yes. other things happening around the, the, the house, um, physical problems that are unexplained. by, by Father, physicians. can you? Again, can you address that? Because that's really important. A mentally ill person can have a negative reaction to something that's sacred and holy, correct? And not be possessed. I, I, I tend to think that one is um, someone who, people who think they are possessed, who think an evil fear is bothering them. Yes. They may well react, and I've seen mm-hmm. that, react to, um, you know, 
crucifix or holy water yes. or whatever. That's why sometimes exorcists try something. Like in the movie, he tried something a little bit tricky. In the movie, the exorcist, he had a holy water bottle with half water in it, you know. So you might they might do something like that. So that one is kind of like an icing on the cake. Yeah, if a person is possessed and shows the other one, one or two of the other signs, yes, they'll they'll also probably you know going to be reacting to the prayer, certain prayers, um, you know, different prayers, uh, exor- uh, crucifix, holy water. Um, yeah. But without the other more more unnatural signs, well, then you've just got a person who thinks they're possessed and therefore reacts like one exorcist. One of the things he asked in his intake interview, as we might call it, and you know, the counselors call it, he called it that too. I think. Um, yeah. He would ask a person, you know, what books and movies on the subject have you seen? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he wants to know what what they might be. You know, if a person is disturbed and worried, then okay, now they're going to start maybe imitating what they've seen. Precisely, they might be obsessed, book. which is a totally okay. different level of. Oppression. Now, here, look, yeah, look, I'll, I'll give you an example of what. Um, Thank you. I, I, I've seen a couple times, and I just got a, a, a weird. I don't go by feelings. I just thought, wow, <laughs> this is you know, a, a, um, you know, anorexia, which now is more common. But mm-hmm. um, some years ago, uh, two different young women, two separate, separate but just they happened. They, I dealt with them both uh, um, about the same time. Um, both had kind of the same description. They said it's just that voice, that voice telling me you should die, you should starve yourself. Look at what oh you're doing gosh. to yourself. Look what you're doing to family. Why don't you just starve and die? And, um, mm. you know, after I heard that a couple of times, I thought, wow, okay, there's certainly, this person's got some mental and emotional struggle. I think they were probably mostly emotional, you know, not, not necessarily, um, you know, a, a hardcore mental thing like a schizophrenia or anything like that. Uh-huh. Um, but, but certainly some emotional problems going on. But wow, was the devil needling them? Yes. Whether we call it, a, you know, that, that would uh, maybe be obsession, you know, meaning kind of obsessive thought. Um, but it just seemed to me, yeah, wow, this is, this is, because these were very, smart, you know, and in many ways normal young women with this awful yes. problem. Yeah. So that's, I guess, I think of, is there something emotional going on? Definitely. Something spiritual? Eh, I think so. You know, so that's one of the things we talked about. You can, you know, what's that old phrase, demon rum, you know, um, yes. and uh, when we talk about, you know, alcoholism. Well, I talked to a, a hardcore alcoholic who has, who has tried repeatedly to quit, yes. and you're thinking, wow, this person really wants to stop. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not so much the devil made me do it, it's that this person is weak in this regard, and, uh, and boy, there's the devil attacking the weakness. So those would be those, I think, examples of that uh, middle area. And same thing with the schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic, who then yes. really does maybe get some demons bothering him, and, and we can't tell because he's also believing, you know, that aliens are hanging around too. So um, so we want to address those spiritual things with all those people. That That's the bottom line. It sounds like a no-brainer, address both problems, but that really is really important. I think I hope I stress that in the book. Yes. Make sure we look at both and try to address both the mental and the spiritual um, emotional and that's that's really important in your book because you definitely delineate you know there is physical there's spiritual there's mental we have so many things that affect us as humans and i think that the way you put it so succinctly and simply gives us the idea that it's not that it's so complicated it takes some time just to relax Go ahead. Yeah, and West yeah. in the West here, we're so used to specialization, which is a good thing, but we lose out a little bit on the holistic aspect, so we want to keep that in mind. And treating the, the person as a whole instead of just automatically assuming they're mental. Yeah, or right. Physical, assuming mental, that spiritual, emotional, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or they're demonized, like in another country, oh, yeah, yeah. the person's possessed, just, just right. you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Don't, don't just get too, too focused on one part of this person. We're looking at a human being here. Let's look at everything going on with them. Something I wanted to touch on real quick, if it's a point of interest, is the knowledge of demons, the fallen angels. I think people don't think about that they do have this ability to well to say there is no discernment when you're an angelic spirit it's only for us because we're confused by what we see what we hear what we're tempted by and all that and the only thing we got is to use some sort of mentorship or inspiration divinely from the you know the holy spirit intercession of angels and saints guardian angel you know, that kind of thing. Else we're lost. Else we're going to be waving sage like gypsies or, you know, whatever. We need that template. And so for us, we find that 2,000 years of Christianity, they learn something and they know something. So welcome back for the second hour. Yes, welcome back, Father. And guess what? I have to tell you personally, we got a message, a private message from a girl that said the information that you shared tonight so touched her on on a personal level that she knew she knew God was speaking through you to her tonight. So I just wanted to say that sometimes we don't always get affirmation. You're where you're supposed to be. But I 
had to share that, Father. So thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, thank you. Gosh, I'm glad something was helpful to the woman out there. Thank you. You never know. You never know where these little seeds get dropped. You really don't. And we're back up talking about your book and, you know, people that don't understand that they might be truly mentally disturbed. They believe they're possessed, Father. You know, I was thinking over the break, you, um, one of the, I think we left off to talking again about the different yes. uh, things that can be difficult to discern. One of them that I, I don't know why it kind of has the reputation of being difficult to distinguish from possession, and that is uh, from the point of view of psychologists. Yes. Um, they will sometimes say, oh, you've got someone, uh, you know, exorcist or the person themselves claiming all these different spirits. Well, they're they're actually suffering from what used to be called multiple personality disorder. Mm-hmm. You know, think of that old Sybil uh, movie or yeah. in the more recent diagnosis. It's, it's pretty much the same. It's just a renamed uh, dissociative identity disorder. Yes. The point being that a person seems to have different personalities. But I, I don't know why those would be confused. I, you know, as much as I read and, mm-hmm. and I've been around, I, like I said, I've not seen anyone I, uh, that I was convinced was fully possessed. I have been around yes. multiple personality disorder and um, dissociative identity disorder, as it's called. And the different personalities are not all evil. In fact, none of them. You might have one that seems like a really, really bad person. Yes. Um, but the others aren't, and so I don't know why that. Why I, I think that psychologists, uh, some psychologists, say they don't want to lump them all, of course, because that's my field too. Mm-hmm. But I think they're just kind of grasping to explain the unexplainable and explain it in terms of of, of you know modern American uh, psychological diagnoses. Um, because generally, like when when someone's got these multiple personalities, it, it comes from terrible abuses as a child, yes. and so the typical childhood things get get terribly you know twisted and exaggerated. So. Um, um, you'll have one, maybe one personality that remains very childlike and, and maybe very happy. Um, yeah. You might get the one that's very angry and vengeful. That would, I could see how that one, someone would say, boy, that seems like a demon. Yes. Well, yeah, but it's but it's this person who's subject to abuse and, and kind of split into this one one part of their personality mm-hmm. just trying to be happy to survive. But the other part, we've got, the anger's got to be somewhere. Okay, well, that's another one. Yes. And then maybe one is very fearful because they grew up being afraid. Can you imagine that being, you know, it's like yeah. a Concentration camp. You're growing up in your home, being scared to death every day. So that kind of becomes exaggerated and a separate personality. So that's what goes on with that. But but those personalities don't seem evil, other than maybe you might get one. You know, the the angry, vengeful one. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, I point that out as um, again, I I think a case of uh, modern psychology trying to fit something into their terms that just doesn't work. If they're, if uh, exorcists say that usually demons are in groups yeah. Um, yeah. as the garrison demoniac, and um, mm-hmm. but they're all bad. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. you have some that are kind of lighthearted and nice. You know, that's so in other words, you're not going to have good genies in the same bottle with the bad genies. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, no, like all delinquents or something like that. Yeah, you know that thing when you're kind of forced to go in, and usually something triggers it, and, and when we're watching those movies like Sybil and so forth, you find out that, the you know, the a person interviewing them lost patience, so it probably triggered some memory of how I got to get subdued now because mommy's gonna, you know, put my hands over a burner if I don't get quiet and somber real quick, you know. And you know, I mean, yeah, that can split up different modes of, of sort, and then they it's like autism right now. Autism has got way too many spectrums. And sugar hype kids, mentally retarded kids, savants are categorized with the same. Kids who are going to grow up and work for Microsoft or, you know, help program the next microchips or make robots or something. It's not the same thing. I, you yeah, know. The, the, the DSM, as they call it, the Diagnostic and Statistical yes. Manual, the fifth one just came out. It's been a year and a half. It, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, it's helpful to try and categorize things as long as we kind of realize, like you're pointing out a great example there. Yeah, we're just trying to come up with some helpful categories. We mm-hmm. don't want to pretend that those things are set in stone because 10 years from now, the, the American Psychiatric Association is going to change them again. I know. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are what you know. They are what they are. They're helpful. You know, it, it, it can be helpful to to come up with some categories to describe problems. You know, of course, it can be helpful, yes. but not to not to play put you know to pretend that they're set in stone um, because they do. You know, as we learn more, they change, and the politics of it. It got it got this last version got silly. Mm-hmm. We could go on about that, but anyway, if yeah. they were taking input, and anyone, you, me, anyone could could um, submit our opinion. Well, gosh, are you going to trust your your neurosurgeon if he's getting 
input on diagnoses from the public. I mean, you got to be kidding me. But but they but they did that for these diagnoses, so it became a little bit silly. Hmm. Now, unless it yeah. comes it's from help. someone it's like yourself, helpful. for example, but, you know, if you're not a member of that prestigious board. True. You know, that sounds like uh, sounds like how much fun I would have to be prestigiously bored. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. That's but, again, you know, I've been doing that since they've been taking social pressure. I remember DSM-2 and uh, some controversial topic. We'll say we don't want to get into in the show at the moment. But they had people coming here and protesting and disrupting these meetings where they're basically discussing what's going to be in the next edition, and then they eventually put it in there. That's not how you do medicine or psychology or psychiatry. <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, one of my great instructors, a uh, counseling instructor, said, uh, well, he said, well, keep in mind that, that the whole DSM is from psychiatrists who are medical doctors. He said, we're counselors. We're, he said that we don't really think in those terms. Again, it can be helpful, but um, yeah. we try to be a little bit more holistic. Uh, and that's not to be down on physicians that are. They, physicians are what they are. That's that's what mm-hmm. they do. Uh, you know, I can't prescribe medicine or do surgery, you know, yeah. so that's that's their field. But but the counseling, uh, you know, it tries to be a little bit more holistic. I mean, Thomas St. Thomas Aquinas did not write a section on psychology. Um, it would be neat if he did. But that's but on the other hand, then he would have been doing the specialized thing. He was talking about the human person, yeah. and um, in his writings about the human person, you get great psychology. You just you don't get to read it just as his psychology chapter. You read it in the context of the whole human person spirit and physical and all. Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing, and I think the only thing useful about the DSM-5 or the 4, you can still talk in those terms, even if you use multiple personality disorder or MPD out of context, they'll look at you like, uh, what year did you graduate? Oh, I didn't go to school. That figures. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah. uh, it's because you can talk turkey with the... Uh, and we have to deal with psychologists in our work, and I'm sure you're going to do it a lot more there, dealing with that kind of thing every day. And if I don't know how to talk to talk and walk to walk, I won't be able to transfer what I've learned and what I have observed to their desk and their mind so they can analyze it from their perspective. You know, So how am I going to transfer it? You know. Right, and that is one of the values of, of the DSM, to try and have some kind of, you know, that we can describe the problem, you know, um, but mm-hmm. it's just, it is what it is. Again, it's limited, you know. Yeah, but that's a very important topic tonight, and, you know, much of the share, it's hard to really know. Okay, we're coming upon a break here on Demonology Today. We'll be right back after these messages. Demonology Today, we're talking about a mental evaluation here and common mental ailments that can be mistaken for possession or otherwise to some degree. You know, what is the most uh, pronounced and focused areas? I think one of the things I'll just throw in there real quick, the one I run into the most is suspected, uh, and we're back to that again, is paranoid schizophrenia. And, yeah. uh, you know, we were uh, talking with you at one point, and you made a uh, a, a very yes. uh, a very comprehensive statement on telling the difference between, you know, a real paranoid schizophrenic yeah. And where it's just mental versus something that's, you know, more demonic. And could you share with us some insight on that? Um, I think what I, what I'd said was I, that I don't think we really can know that. Yes. Um, well, here, one of the exorcists I talked to, um, and he's, that was a few years ago. So let's say by now he's probably, but at that time he'd done maybe 10 or 15 cases of full possession over maybe mm-hmm. that many years. He he said he might talk to uh, up to 1,000 people in a year and uh-huh. who thought they were possessed. And I said, are you serious, 1,000? I said, that's like three a day. He said, yep, that's right, <laughs> several people a day. Oh when I said gosh. about how many of them do you think actually are possessed, said, oh, maybe one maybe two. Oh so my that's how gosh. many, yeah. it, it, not that the people were faking it, these are people mm-hmm. who were suffering and, and saying, Very I think much I've got so. a demon. And, and he didn't think they were full possession. Now again, they could be yeah. at the lower level. But then when right. I asked the follow-up question, okay, well, how many of those cases of full possession, how many think had a mental disorder in addition? He said, oh, I think all of them did. I said, oh, yeah. really? So that was a light bulb for me, that here's an experienced exorcist who, who thinks that in his experience, yes. full possession has always come on top of uh, you know, a more or less severe mental problem, mm. wow. uh, which, which just, again, reinforces for us, you know, address both problems 
you know, address the whole, because again, yeah. as a human being, it you know, is. what's going on with you emotionally, mentally, have you seen a doctor, you know, what if you've got a thyroid problem? True. You know, that, that's oh, a yeah, thing. thyroid it, problems, you'll off. murder your husband. Uh, <laughs> gosh, I don't know if you've, <laughs> I don't know if you've <laughs> probably had that one anyone, <laughs> you know, pars, postpartum depression oh, can be so terrible for women, and if, and we've got good, now the pro, comes from the, the pro-life physicians that yes. have found the hormone, you know, developed the hormone treatments for that, but untreated, and if that gets severe, occasionally that can lead to a psychosis. And then you get these horrible, you know, you read some of these terrible stories. How did this woman kill her child or kill herself or whatever? It's a chemical thing that, on okay, again, very rare, but that, that can go so badly to really affect a, a, a woman's, you know, capacity to reason. Um, yeah, so... Uh, we definitely want to address. Oh, you know, we've got a, a suffering human being here. Okay, mm-hmm. let's look at what's. Let's look at everything we can to, to relieve their suffering. Jesus, of course, could do it in a word. It was all cured. What you know, yes. physical, mental, emotional, death. Even when he wanted to raise a person from the dead on those few occasions. So um, we can't discern so much. So we have to look at all the all all, the, all the extenuating factors. Mm-hmm. You know, Father, we have. Uh, um I've spoken to a couple of different exorcists when we have cases from time to time. And one of our uh, favorites to uh, talk to that we can rarely ever pin down is Father Chad Ripiger. And uh, a lot of his private lectures are very full of Thomastic theology and his experience, you know, as an exorcist and how he works with his team. And an, an interesting note that he made um, that I'd like your opinion on that, uh, you know, from your research and, and, and your your point of view is he works a lot, you know, with, you know, mental health patients, and he works a lot with cases of, uh, what was that one, Kenny, that we just came across recently yeah, that, that can mask itself as, you know, oppression. It, it was a, a lesser form of a mental illness, but maybe I'll remember it in a minute. I'm having, I apologize, a 50s-plus moment, Father. Is it, is it, is it a 50s-plus illness? <laughs> yeah, it's a 50s-plus <laughs> illness. Nice of you, dear. Sorry about that. But you, the question is, okay, if Father Rippinger states things like this in his life, and that if exorcism were an option in today's mental health wards, 80% of clients, you know, that are diagnosed with yeah, some of these illnesses. Was, that was schizophrenic. Uh, but yeah, well, he, one of them was schizophrenia. Yeah, the uh-huh. other one was something as simple as um, bipolar disorder. He said that 80% of oh, clients that's right, bipolar, yes. Yes, could go home and leave the hospital having full faculties of right reason, maintaining their medical, and being exercised. They would not need the care, and we'd have empty hospitals. Do you? agree that that number could be that high in today's medical environment or maybe I, I, i've known father ripiger for years and he's a friend of mine so i'd, I'd have to be very careful and, and <laughs> oh okay as well we i apologize i'll discussion. reword the question um, no i can adri- i can address it but just i want to because we admire by, him uh, enormously uh, too uh, i just want to preface it by he's a friend and a great and we've had this discussion uh, you know several times over the years um on this topic um he was one that inspired me to look into it more when i was really classes yeah. oh yeah yeah oh he's my gosh it's good to know classes. yeah yeah he's so that doesn't mean we have the exact same opinion on of all course not else, though, uh-huh. so, but i want to preface it by that that this is not a critique of uh, father Ripper, of course not the, you know these are father the, we wouldn't ask you to do that promise have, yeah um i i can't boy i can't see it being that high maybe well, well you but maybe not but but you kind of you kind of the way you describe what he said he qualified it continue yes. to see you know physician yeah. and things like that yeah so is there some boy what, what i qualified it by my opinion in case you didn't understand that. I, I, yeah. That's my opinion because from what we've seen, you know, I don't know if it's it's totally a wipeout. Like you know, an exorcist could go in there and just bless all these people and exercise all these people. I would mm-hmm. still maintain that they would probably need a dose of medication to help them help to level it off. There might be more of this now than before. This might be a, a statistic that's more applicable to uh, the last two three years. I've seen a lot of changes as you have, um, but you know, so, but yeah, we want your opinion. your opinion because I we agree with Father Chad. We won't be a offended either if you have an alternate opinion that's what the show is about so we can share some ideas here's yeah here's one kind of bluntly if that's the case, boy, then then why aren't we doing that? And I'd be I'd be very surprised if a priest came in. I don't know if you again. I don't know if you're talking about full possession or something lesser than that. But mm-hmm. um, but it's just that doing exorcisms on each person and that many would be cured. Yes. I, I I would be stunned if it were anywhere near that <laughs> amount. Yeah. Again, as opposed to, is there some level of demonic attack? Oh, that I who knows? You know, yes. uh, I I can believe that about. Effect. I I wouldn't even begin to guess. That's why I think. 
the, the spiritual aspect should be addressed like yes. 100% of the time in case it is 80%. Oh, there you go. Know, oh, that's a good that's one. Them. That's it. So, that's yeah, I always want to address that. But I'm up there saying prayers, sprinkling holy water on our mental health unit every day. I wow. have yet to see a, an unnatural reaction. I mm -hmm. do have conversations with people who think they've got, you know, demonic attack. That's, that's not unusual at all mm -hmm. for them to, to be saying that and for us to, do, you know, say our prayers and that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't... You know, the idea of deliverance prayers, I'm a little bit leery sometimes. It sounds like someone takes their favorite prayer, prayer and calls it a deliverance prayer, and it's supposed to be more powerful. <laughs> um, you know, so you, how did you start the show? St. Michael the Archangel. That yes. is history behind it. That was said after every Mass. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, it was. Right. One of my favorite parts in the Rite of Exorcism, somewhere in the midst of it, says the priest, um, I, I can't I have to read the exact quote, That's but okay. it says um, throughout uh, the priest should, uh, you know, say often the creed, the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Oh, in other words, the prayers of the rosary. You know, right yes. there in the rite of exorcism is telling that those three prayers should be said by the exorcist. Well, you and I can't just do an exorcism when we want, but we can sure say the rosary. Amen. And in fact, I think I got this from Ripperger. He said, very important yeah. to when we're praying, let's say I'm praying the rosary um, yes. for a person who I think might have a demonic problem. Very important to ask God and to say, God, this, you know, please accept this rosary. Blessed Virgin, please accept this rosary for this specific intention of this person's demonic problem with the, and it, again he really is a great guy he's very intelligent and then he comes up with these very simple things is because God listens to our prayers and answers them yes. you know, oh that's right you know yeah. so if I ask for this not every time the way I want but mm -hmm. certainly God is going to honor that that if I'm praying this rosary you know with this person this person's demonic problems in, in mm -hmm. mind that's going to have some effect yeah wow there's so many variables that, that that the problem I think is the big one and that's the variables and we run into it a lot of times too and one of them is the uh, will uh, and another one is like let's say someone is trying to be cured of cancer and they're praying a rosary novena uh, some people actually don't really care to live longer even though they might on the outside seem like they do because there's yeah. some reasons and that affects the will too but all these variables you might end up with someone who's actually surrendered to their psychosis that could have been originally uh, something from temptation you know the, um, something so simple and they help bring them then to that subdued fashion uh, you know like uh, bringing a an alcoholic to uh, um, you know where they're at from being a social drinker or something um, you know it's funny too about the mentally ill is that I've been to uh, a place that was supposed to have just mentally challenged and never and everybody was there was um, low IQ you know Down syndrome and all this other uh, things and then you go to a place where they're just supposed to be mentally ill, but not mentally handicapped, you know, in the other way, you know, like, and right. I can't tell mm -hmm. the difference. They, you know, there is a, a band there and uh, yeah. they, it's like being, it, both of them are the same. Yeah. And, and uh, it's kind of funny. It's like they become little children, you know, in both fashions, being uh, low in IQ, like they never quite develop and they go back to that yep. when they have a breakdown or whatever happens, you know. And that's kind yeah, of a surrender yeah. of the will, isn't it? Go ahead. Um, that's, there's overlap there, and certainly I meet people who, um, <clears throat> you know, with mental health problems, and, and they seem very low functioning, and they, at the moment they are very low functioning IQ. Yeah. Then you find out, oh, they've got a master's degree in engineering or this or that sometimes. Oh, wow. So they weren't always functioning at this low level. Yeah. You know, wow. At some point they were better, and they may get back to better, too. Some of these mental illness stuff is very mysterious. Sometimes people seem to you know, go into crisis and come out of crisis for mm -hmm. reasons we can't see. Um, and that's just reminds us of our, of our limitations, you know. That's what I was going to ask you about, that whole mental illness um, plateau. Because a lot of times, you know, the, the cases where you have a very, very strong oppression obsession, <laughs> people will not show any signs of really being on their way to possession until something sets them off. And I think in some ways that's similar to mental illness from the schizophrenics that I've known. And um, the, I've, I've known quite a few mentally ill people that they'll be completely uh, right reasoning, you know, proper faculties. They'll be handling the small, minute tasks of the day. They'll be on their medication. Then all of a sudden something sets them off and boom, they yeah. can be in a different world for hours or days. Just very similar to somebody possessed, depressed, or on their way to possession. Father, what do you that's think about that? Yeah, good one. Yeah, well, keeping in mind the way you just described it, um, yes. 
um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which, you know, again, it's yes. a modern name for where do we get that phrase shell-shocked? Well, in World yeah. War I, they started to recognize, wow, these guys, you know, coming back from the, the trenches where the shelling was taking place, and they're back here, and they hear something, and suddenly they think they're back in the trench in, you know, in France. So, um, yeah, a person who's gone through a terrible trauma or abuse, and then again, if you get someone who was abused in different ways yes. repeatedly, mm -hmm. that means there can be a number of things that mm -hmm. can set them off. You know, mm -hmm. if it's someone who is strictly, uh, let's, uh, you know, for example, has something to do with um, a war or something, uh, firearms, okay, maybe it's just going to be a, a car backfire, some kind of a loud noise that's going to trigger a flashback. Oh, wow, with People PTSD. who were abused yeah. in different ways over the course of years, there can be any number of triggers. So mm -hmm. that's the worst extreme case of it, um, but what you're describing, it's still, um, mm. we don't always, you know, what, what and, and that what we're talking about is just kind of an extreme version of what all of us who are, have reasonably, you know, good mental health, thanks be to mm -hmm. God, we still, you know, we have yes, a good day and you, bad day, Jesus. and we can't always describe why, and then sometimes yeah. we can describe why, oh yeah, this yeah. happened, and boy, it reminded me of that other time, <laughs> and it just dragged me down all day, so uh -huh. if you just multiply that for a person who's got some, some more severe mental and emotional struggles, I think, I think we can see a little bit of that ourselves and then just kind of oh, yeah. extrapolate it to people who have been through a lot more. Yeah, and the exterior does seem to trigger things, too. You know what I'm thinking? And then almost we talked a... about the demonic. Yes. Boy, I think, yeah. I think Ripperger is a big on this, too. I, I think, I don't know that we'll ever have that figured out either. I think there probably are, for lack of a better word, rules. I don't think it's completely, it looks pretty random to us when a, a demon possesses someone. Now, yes. there'll be those common, you know, they probably open some kind of a door, yes. but yeah. lots of people open doors. Look at all the people involved in Wicca and all those things oh and how many few of them are fully possessed, yeah. how many people are in habits of severe mortal sins and how, exactly. uh, how few That's of true. them are actually fully possessed. So it seems kind of random to us. I'll, I'll bet it's not. I'll bet from the spiritual world point of view, there's something, you know, systematic going on from the demons, um, but I don't know that we'll ever figure that out. Yeah, I think the oppression thing, I think it was, uh, it's the higher number instead of possession. And, uh, you know, there's some people that we dealt with that are actually, you know, suffering from or have been from oppression that they could have physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. Well, and there was another one that uh, we uh, dealt with, and after her uh, deliverance, because uh, an exorcism went done, because it was just oppression, that yeah, her schizophrenic oppression. symptoms went away. And you remember this character that we were talking about earlier yes. in this TV show actually was dealing with her, and he just said, oh, she's paranoid, schizophrenic, blah, 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 she's a moron, blah, blah, blah. He said all these things about her, and I said, you know, she's fine now. It's gone. Um, you know, um, one of my relatives had dementia yeah. and, uh, and we had the priest go up because she started getting kind of odd symptoms and I wasn't familiar with dementia, I would admit it, and, you know, up close and personal like that, but she stopped saying a rosary for no reason and made excuses and, and I just thought, you know, I'm, I want to have that chaplain go up and do some, some of these prayers. And he went up and he said some prayers that basically are designed to tell us, you know, any kind of evil spirits that might have attached themselves to get lost yeah. instead of doing the, you know, the anointing of the sick or something like that. And her, her dementia symptoms went away for six weeks. And then it started coming back and it kind of slowly eased in. Because if your mind is weak, you know, like you have a loss of a loved one or, you know, and her husband was only dead for six months. Um, she died right before her, you know, entering this uh, nursing facility. There's a lot of things that can war, you know, um, there's a lot of things that can break us and, and make us... Uh, make us weaker but i was True. thinking father chad what you know to what degree that we can clear the play field and level it off by doing such a thing you know, remove the element of attachments that can come from sin and so forth that have a stronger influence on the person that keep them in that subdued uh mental uh state and when you erase that and then the prayer you put on top of there in a blessing or a healing prayer can help them to heal with the mental issue then it almost seems like that equation that father chad was uh, putting forth might make more sense instead of considering it, it was always an exorcism, uh, you know, doing um, removing a demon like as in a possession. Does that make more sense? Th that makes more sense to me. Like I said, I th we always want to be addressing the, the spiritual part too. Mm -hmm. And, and um, yeah, because, because it is
is unknown what what the influence is, what's, what's causing the damage. Uh, so we just want to address everything. You know, they, with original sin, uh, yes. when we talk about, I mean, the, of course, the worst part was the, the break with God, and that gets healed by baptism. But that's the supernatural part that gets healed. The natural damage, the damage to our nature, does not get healed through baptism. So no. that's why we still have the physical, the, you know, suffering death, emotional. We have emotional problems. Um, weaken of the will and uh, and clouding of the intellect. So those faculties are those aren't cured by by original sin. We're still going to have all those struggles, and uh, and then the devil's going to just be there to egg them on. Well, that nasty devil. You know, I'm yeah. I'm I'm dying to get to this part of your book because this was really really eye opening for me. Basically, because um, about uh, 20 years into my young life. There was a schism in my family from Catholicism to Pentecostalism um, on on part of my family, and uh, the, nothing against Pentecostalism or Charismatics. It just it's not the way I grew up. It it wasn't something I understood, and there were a lot of things that. I, I I simply just disagreed with. Not that it was right or wrong for me. It was it did not work for me. The methods that people use to say, okay, we've got to lay hands and pray on somebody, and they don't like you say, you know, address the holistic person. In your book, Father, that this this thing that impressed me most is how you outlined and you delineated two specific types of discernment. And as you say in your book, you know, both of them have their merits. One is the narrow path and one is the wide path, as you quote from Father Amorth, Father Utenauer, Father Fertea, all exorcist in outlining the wide methods of discernment for exorcism. And you state how you do yourself prefer a much simpler, narrow method that you've coined. We'll continue on after these commercial messages with this topic. We'll be right back. Can you help our listeners by first outlining what the narrow and what the wide is and why there might be some areas of question, some difficulties with one of the methods as opposed to the other? Because this is really fascinating to me how you outline this. Um, yeah, I guess that was a, a research finding, you know, when I was doing my dissertation. It's yes. Just, it's for, uh, interesting that the, the three books you mentioned are the ones I, we talked about the two earlier and then we added right there Father Eitenauer's book to our, our um, English language books yeah. firsthand by exorcists. Yes. And, um, and then I talked to a few exorcists, too, only a few for my dissertation, and um, there was, seemed to be a difference. The, the, the ones I talked to in person, uh, just by chance or whatever, seemed to be um, following, a, following more aspects of what I called the narrow approach. Yes. Um, and I was careful to say that, you know, I'm going to give these two approaches as I found, you know, different aspects fit in a more wide approach and a more narrow approach, but no one fit into either category 100%. So yes. someone like Fortia, who in a number of ways seemed with a narrow approach, but some ways seemed wider, and yes. more seemed pretty much a wide approach all the time, the exodus yes. of Rome. Yeah. Um, and by to give an example of that, um, he, he very uh, explicitly says that when he thinks a person is possessed, given that they have unexplained problems, let's say with relationships, uh, with, uh, with job, with... Yes. Um, family with health okay he's going to he's going to want to do the exorcism to do the full rite of exorcism ah. even though he's not seen the three signs and then he says if they are fully possessed the three the signs will begin to manifest then will begin to show mm. when he's done that and if not he says and this is where i strongly disagree with him he says well then if not well there no one's ever hurt by a by an exorcism that wasn't uh, you know that wasn't needed That's well i would right. disagree if I've got, if I'm talking to one of the people who's schizophrenic and who thinks the devil's in them, but they're really not possessed, if I were to get permission and do an exorcism, yes, uh, and there was nothing, they weren't possessed. Well, I've just, you know, to to for that person to hear me saying, and you demon, you, you oh know, my Prince gosh. of Darkness, all those lines, well, that's just going to reinforce for them. Mm. That that you tell me that if they're belief. Not, if they're not possessed, boy, I've sure tried to mm -hmm. convince them they are. So I see a problem with that. Oh, my um, gosh. So that, that's an aspect of the wider approach, what they, some of them call a, a diagnostic exorcism. Ah. Now, in his defense, Amorth, um, there was a study done of some Italians 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this is interesting. There are only a couple of studies that it's, it would be very hard to do. People who have undergone an exorcism, you know, we, we deliberately don't want to keep records around of that. Mm-hmm. But um, a couple of studies, one was just about 15 people. I think that was the United States, and the other was a little more than that in Italy. The yeah. Italians seem to afterwards consider it a positive experience, where the Americans did not. And, uh, and by the way, yes. the American study was not uh, it was not Catholic exorcism. <laughs> okay, exactly. It was, it was uh, you know, it's like childbirth. That deliverance we, thing. It's the same but the thing. The people there had a very negative wow. reaction, thinking, <clears throat> saying, "I was not put. This wasn't the devil, and and you know, I didn't like being talked to that way." And things that you and I would say too, if someone started talking to us that way. <laughs> um, so it may. So when I crit- criticize Amor, uh, he's over in Italy, and I'm I'm half Italian. I kind of get <laughs> I, I get a little bit of that, you know. Uh, um, makes wow, sense. that's a good but point too. So, I read that. I used to. I remember the quote. I he said it's rather silly to scrutinize the potential victim when no real harm has come from doing an exorcism. And this is why with us, if we're there and investigating a case, we have to discreetly go below the level if it's involving a person. We don't want them to think that we're investigating something that might say that you're demonic. That's demonic. demonic. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Never. Yeah, never. we have to, we we have have to, to look for it. natural causes always. Yeah, we got to be the screen right. because well, what if it's psychological? You know, yeah, priests, exactly. What's that, Father? I'm sorry. Yeah, one of the priests I interviewed, who in a number of ways was a was a more on the wide approach. He was, you know, involved in charismatic renewal and, mm-hmm. you know, with the thinking he was saying scary. a lot of lower level things that I, I probably would disagree with. And yeah. yet, when it came to case of full possession, um, you know, again, he'd been an exorcist for 20 years, and I said, oh, so how many cases of full possession? Oh, and he's kind of mm-hmm. looking. I think, oh boy, he's adding up dozens of them in his head. And yeah. He says, oh, maybe five or six. Oh, so even though he, wow. I, I might. I not mm. think I'm seeing as much, you know, lower obsession, oppression as he did. He was mm-hmm. very careful, narrow approach when it came to the, um, the full possession. And he, he said, oh, no, I don't want to do an exorcism unless I'm really certain. He said, that he said that's a nuclear weapon. I still remember that. When I said, wow, that's a nuclear that's a weapon. Good, you don't jump right analogy. to the nuclear weapon. Yeah. One of the things um, we do for so the that, diocese, uh, it reminds me exactly of this, is we, uh, we're careful to uh, try to help them determine you the know, whole the person so before we spiritually go spiritually and mentally. And we're well, in between for that reason. Psych meds. Yes. You me- you mentioned psych meds, and yes. I guess I'm kind of a middle ground on that. I'm talking mm-hmm. to someone, and you know, if they say, oh, "I'm taking psych meds," I, oh, are those helping you? If they say, "Yeah, they're helping," oh, well, good. Good. I'm not going to tell them we'll quit. You know, that'd be I know. Great. No. Uh, yeah, because they bring the it to a level. The person says, "I'm taking some meds, mm-hmm. and I want to quit. I hate them." Oh, oh, okay. Well, we'll talk to your doctor then. So we do it smart, but yeah, that's a yeah. fine goal if, if you want to give that a try. So, mm-hmm. you know, that I can go either way on that. I do know that some. Gosh, you get a person person who's um, really, I can't have a, a reasonable conversation with someone who's who's too out of it. You reach a point where a person can't it doesn't have the use of reason. No. Unless we can get them back to the use of reason, then there's no not much of a conversation to be had. Um, you know, a person's intoxicated. Well, I'm going to wait till they're sober. Uh, you know, yes. I'm not going to try and have a good, meaningful conversation while they're still you have that. Well, same thing with there's something else going on. If so, sometimes the meds can even if a person doesn't like the idea of it. Well, maybe take them until you know things are a little calmed down, and then we can see what we can do through uh, conversation and spiritual practices but there has to be a certain level of reason to be able to to do that with you know conversation spiritual practices and if meds can help to get to that point well that's fine that's true that that's makes, what we call leveling yeah off. that makes perfect sense father you know the the problem with um you know minor oppressions you know that mm-hmm. have not gotten to uh possession but there's you know, for our listeners out there, there is the ordinary and there is the extraordinary form. Can you explain that to our listeners as opposed to, you know, somebody that's mentally ill and somebody that does have their faculties of reason that is being maybe ordinarily tempted? Oh, you, you're talking about ordinary versus extraordinary? Yes. Can you explain that yeah. to our listeners? Because we're talking a lot about oppression and this is what it deals with as opposed to, no, you're not mental. You don't need to go get on Xanax or anything. This is an ordinary or, or an extraordinary form of being bothered. Uh, generally, uh, and I'm trying to remember if the, if the Catechism of the Catholic Church that mentions that uh, distinction. But ordinary, we usually say we usually uh, say that's te- what temptation is. That's yes. The everyday yes. The devil, you know, devil ordinarily uses temptation. Yes. The others are more rare, and um, 
again, the the only one the church the only ones the church mentions are full possession, mm -hmm. and the other one that infestation, you know, place or thing that the right mentions. Um, uh, uh, the third part of the ritual mentions that. So those oppression obsession are are not church defined. So it depends on who you talk to. But generally, what I think the way that they're defined and they're helpful terms. Yes. Um, just kind of what that word sounds like. Um, oppression. You know, that sounds like something from the outside, doesn't it? You know, we say yes. yeah. oh, something like pushing from the outside. So oftentimes that word is used like for St. John Vianney when he was getting literally oh, you know, beat wow. up physically by the devil. Yes. Um, oppression, people might use that term for you know, um, physical, uh, physical you know, diseases and things caused by demons. Mm -hmm. um, or um, Now, infestation is if a demon is attached to a house, but what if like one woman I knew that had moved a couple of times mm -hmm. and yeah. each place she went it seemed to have some problem of, of things moving and noises and things like that and her roommate was vouching for it. Well, the woman mm -hmm. had, had told me, yeah, years ago I was dabbling in this stuff and now I think this thing is following me. That would be an oppression. Usually we use the word oppression as something from the outside. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I talked about the young woman with, uh, who seemed to have this voice, you know, telling her, you know, she was uh, struggling with anorexia and seemed to have this voice telling her, you should die. Why don't you starve? You're horrible. And oh my gosh. Uh, your family just died. Uh -huh. That sounds more like obsession, you know, something the devil is obsessing, uh, giving her obsessive thought. So that's generally how mm -hmm. those two terms are used, but, but they're not official. So mm -hmm. it depends yeah. on who you talk to, but I found that a useful kind of division. Totally. Uh, completely. You know, devil, the, yeah. We have one outside, question you know, from our chat room. The inside obsession. I'm sorry. It's okay. We have one chat, chat room question about Catholic specifically because the person is Methodist and she's a dear heart and she's a love and she's trying to understand why is it father that only Catholics perform exorcism I don't know why other and actually I'm sure some others do like the one you said <laughs> mentioned <it was> Methodist, <laughs> yes or he tries that to. other no. one we mentioned that's an actor reading so. from a script yeah. So, so, so I, why? That, that's an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Why others, other faiths generally call it deliverance? Yes. And we stick with the word exorcism. Uh, that that seems like more of a linguistic, you know, a, lang a language difference. Um, yeah. But so that might be what her question is about, or she might be asking a deeper question. Mm -hmm. Why don't they have um, more of an exorcism ritual? Well, True. keeping in mind that. Uh, Catholic Church has been around longer, the, and the Eastern Orthodox too have their ritual. I think it's the one by Saint yes. Basil. Saint Basil the Great, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I would just that would be my answer to why we actually have rites, R I T E, you know, rituals of exorcism mm -hmm. because we've been around for so long. That's what you eventually do. You eventually, you know, codify something. It, it wasn't, you know, in the early days of the Church. And in fact, uh, I think I started to mention that Father Grob's um, dissertation on the history of the rite talks about those in the Middle Ages. Is, you know, let's say, and not everything was as bad and dark as, as anti-Catholics like to say. Were there problems? Yeah, there are always problems around. And one of the problems at that time was maybe too many people thinking they're seeing too many demons, and the church responded appropriately. You know, okay, from now on, only a priest and only a priest with the bishop's permission um, can do an exorcism. So that was a, a good rule that was put into place so we don't end up with a, a circus atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, and then if you <laughs> yes. get a mentally ill person, they'll say, he, he didn't deliver me, and then you'll, you know, be protesting and now with this, this news media and everything, that can be that can be quite a mess. I think the word subjugation is this connection point. We're talking about how drugs can uh, bring someone leveled out to control their psychological or physical. Yes. You know, like if you're depressed and you have a drug, that will actually take you out of depression. And you're also oppressed. Obviously, if you're taking out of depression a bit more, the devil can't use it as much against you because you've leveled it out with some other means. Hey, great. You know, um, subjugation seems to be when your will caves and so forth. Explain subjugation if you can. It's the one that some people, I've seen people write articles and they mention, uh, you know, obsession, infestation, oppression, and they leave out subjugation. I'm like, well, you left out subjugation. You know, it's like that's probably the most important one. It's not like a transition. Could you share it with us, especially as it relates to mental health, the, the subjugation as it pertains to a, a stage leading to a form of possession eventually? Um, I can't. Boy, you'd have to tell, you'd have to tell me what you you're, um, again, that's not a church term, so would, I'm sure it would depend on what you're, who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, subjugation, kind of like an, um, you're talking about like an, almost like an enslavement. That kind of is that the, what you're kind of talking yes. about as far as the spiritual. Yes. yes, but you can do you can subjugate yourself to uh, psychological things, um, but the demonic takes advantage of that because they can get you to subjugate to whatever you're obsessed with. 
since obsession precedes subjugation. So you're talking yes. about more oppression through something that you're attached to. Yeah, eventually. The, Is that the, what you're talking it, about, Ken? It's the stages that a demonic can use, and those are the, what you fall into. You fall in trap A, trap B, and obsession, subjugation, oppression, and possession. And how subjugation, because it has to do with the will again, it seems like that seems to play the part in here, maybe, um, that you have a person who is subjugated to something already, you can almost skip stages or you can get to that one faster. Say if they're, they've are they been to a war and they're shell-shocked, PTSD. Or they're already hooked on drugs or they're potential an alcoholic and they because they were in the past. You know, those kind of things uh, are doorways. If you're not familiar with the term, uh, I, apparently maybe it's why I'm not reading the articles. I'm not seeing people cover it. Father Amorth did. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about Father Rippinger, uh, but it doesn't seem to be used is very much, but it seemed to me like it was one that did well to bridge the gap between, uh, you know, uh, that later stage and something so simple or more simple as op- as obsession, which can just be and over I a person. Go ahead. I guess I don't, and I don't look at them really as necessarily steps in that way because, again, if we look at like a, a, a John Biani maybe under some kind of a demonic attack, but I don't think it was, I don't think he, he had okay. necessarily gone through obsession and, and was certainly not leading to possession. So I don't know that I necessarily see that i think they could be you know steps one after the other but but certainly not not necessarily and in fact i think that those those the lower the level the more common they would be in other words i think i've seen a number of people maybe with you know struggling with the especially with the obsession because that tends to be like i said that interior kind of relate and looks like mental and is maybe mixed in sometimes with mental problems Mm -hmm. but i've never seen what i thought was full possession so i say i think those are more are more common but not always leading to possession even though i'm sure that they, they could be. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, subjugation, exactly. it sounds like, okay. yeah, when you're stressing the, the subjugation of the will, like a person turning the will over to a certain problem, a certain mm-hmm. sin, or, or just by habit, maybe not such a dramatic when I say turn over, that almost sounds like a dramatic statement. I think the greater danger is just building up a habit and next thing you know, well, how did I get here? Well, one step at a time. Um, yeah. Yes. So um, if, that, if that's what you mean by subjugation. Yeah, okay. that, you know, the, you know, we're almost out of time. The intellect and the will, the two higher powers of the soul, mm-hmm. um, they need to be kind of in a balance. Um, either one exaggerated is, is bad. Um, yes. Too much on the will tends toward evil. In other words, if I'm, you know, not using my brain, I'm just going by my passions mm-hmm. or my senses. Well, and if my will is going to follow those, that's going to lead to great evil. The intellect, thinking too much, you know, when, when someone's got an anxiety problem, what, they're, they're, you know, afraid of too many things. We want to say, hey, lighten up. For, don't worry about that. Go do, you know, go take a walk. Go, uh, you know, whatever. Draw a picture. Write a poem. Anything other than thinking so hard about what can go wrong or, or, or with depression. Stop thinking about all the sad things. You know, think of something good. Go play a game. Go fly a kite. Anything, you know. So yeah. that we, we want them to not think so much. And, and yet with the person who's emphasizing the will too much, whoa, we want them to think. Stop going on your emotions and, and, and passions and senses and, and start using your brain a little bit. So it yes. sounds like you were talking about the subjugation kind of too much, uh, mm-hmm. turning their will over to something other than their, their use of reason. So we've got to kind of draw them back and say, let's think this through. And yeah. Use our use our God given intellect. That's true. It simplifies it what? way too much. It is a spiritual warfare essence more than anything, and it doesn't lead to you know necessarily like you said. It, it can stop there because obviously the alcoholic's not possessed or oppressed. I mean, he is in a certain way demonized. Is what that what some of the other denominations call it, which is not oppression. You know, that's just like an attachment of a sort that comes through to you know sin. Not like you're yeah, crossing a cursed grave. You know. And I see now what you're saying. Yeah, and that's that's a good uh, huge good point. I, there's too much emphasis I, I, sometimes on uh, like the disease model of, of addiction and, and even the word addiction. I, I, I wish we only used that word for the physical aspect, you, you yeah. know, the, the, the drug in the body or whatever. In other words, I don't like addiction when it talks about gambling. Now, habit, the habit of gambling can be very terrible, someone who's doing it too much. So I think that's what you're, I see what you mean talking about that. And that is a huge thing. Aquinas used the word habit. Maybe that sounds too small, but he didn't mean it small. Ha- mm-hmm. Habit is huge um, because it, it, it 
bad habits weaken our will, as you're saying, and, and we've got to strengthen it again a step at a time mm-hmm. by good habits. And again, that's what that's what virtues are. The virtues are habits of doing good. Yes. Wow. And the theology is is key in this stuff. As we keep digging and digging, we find out that's the only way it gets done. You know, those little... right. And if mm-hmm. there's one, maybe as a last note, the thing that uh, if there's anything underrated, uh, well, many things, but um, the avoiding occasions of sin. You know, yes. I can be praying all I want, and if I throw myself into occasions where I know I'm going to sin, well, I wasted those prayers. Now, yeah. I probably didn't waste the prayers, and in reality, usually we're praying to help, you know, God help me avoid those, yeah. give me the will and the intellect to to avoid those occasions of sin. But yeah, we, you know, we put ourselves in, in occasions of sin and um, yeah. we're kind of too late. You know, we've already, we've already made, we've already committed the sin. We should have, we should have made the smart decision earlier on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah we're almost out of time here, believe it or not. Oh, it just tells you that uh, it's easy to have uh, Father on and to go on. And when we have you on again, we'll cover a, a different, this is our main topic tonight, mental versus, you know, the demonic uh, effects or spiritual or however you may. And we wanted to go in as deep as we could on it because we didn't get to cover deliverance professionals and some of these others. And I didn't even know, um, I'm going to talk to you on a separate note since we're almost out of time. You remember about your opinion about some of the apparitions like false apparitions versus positive. And, you know, some of these things are not necessarily covered in your book, but there's so much to talk yeah. about. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've introduced this fabulous facet of our halftime show. It's a great way that we can stay on our toes as opposed to sleeping at the desk like we like to do. So, <laughs> seriously, I mean, cream Lucky cheese you. on my fingers. We, we just want to thank you for being there and thank you for supporting our efforts to educate and help people get to the truth. And there's, you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, there's more than one truth. No, there really isn't more than one truth. And each and every single person out there is infused by God to recognize that truth when he hears it. This this topic is too important, especially in a paranormal community today, folks, that is riddled with everything from, hmm, well, let's see. I think they're automatically demon possessed. I mean, we hear that all the time, don't we, Kenny? Yeah, there's a demon. You got a demon, and then they leave the people hanging. Wait, 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 wait a second. You know, maybe the people threw their meds away. I mean, that's the funny thing. Tonight, instead of having our worldly minute of wonder, we're actually going to be telling you about some of the similarities between this movie that we checked out. And uh, I think Karen Smurl, we shared it with you. This was the um, film, The Visit. But before we do that, guess what? It's Ken's moment because before we cover this film, oh, stop your giggling, honey. I'm not going to forget you, I promise. We're going to go over the Ask a Demonologist a question, not like, you know, I know what I'm talking about. Ow! <laughs> Shit. Uh, big question that we've been asked many times, and uh, people ask if demons can make you sick, and uh, the big answer, of course, is yes. I'm not talking about on-site when someone runs out because they feel nauseous going into a haunted house or whatever like that. We're talking about the long-term effects, which it can even come from curses or proximity effects or, or whatever. Generational curses, you name it. All spiritual attachments or demonic influence or oppression in some form. So since, you know, it suspectingly could be something besides just scientific in its source, well, then we want to seek maybe possible additional measures besides the science of medicine and popping pills and chemo and all that painful stuff. My dad died of throat cancer, so... Just so everybody knows, uh, you know, I'm not poking fun at people with cancer. I've been, you know, through the ringers on suffering for my dad's loss um, a year ago uh, or so. So what do we look for? Spiritual solutions, yep. prayers for cancer. i got 13 points That here. was a really good one, too, Kenny. That was a really, really good one that you put up. I like that a lot. And then we got it on uh, prayers, um, the prayer the prayer warriors mm-hmm. group. Yes. Uh, prayers for the spiritually afflicted. Can I That's crunch on Facebook. my crackers now? You can crunch the crackers Thank because I'm not going to make you read this. Thank you. Okay, this is taking it right off the sheet, and I just wrote it this morning because someone asked 
me about something along the lines of cancer will just say. And I'm, the first thing I'm going to start is start a rosary novena. It, can, it will probably take too long if we go into detail. We can do another one, but do a rosary novena for this petition. That's very important. Look Please. it up on Google if you yes. don't know what it is. <laughs> Get some exercise and blessed oil. That's the oil, that's, you know, just like holy water. Yep. Where it's exercised to sort of purify it because everything in this world is tainted. And then it's blessed. So, you know, special blessing. It doesn't need to be in Latin. You can get the prayers off the Internet or one of our um, one of our books that have the priest say. And, uh, you know, put three drops on your food that you eat, saying the name of Jesus Christ and by his precious blood, I bless, bless my food in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. And you can say that in addition to thanks for, your, thanks for the food, kind of a different blessing. And number three, have a priest do an anointing of the sick. Have them to do that uh, that other sacrament. This is you know, advice for Catholics to some point that uh, only Catholics can receive, such as uh, communion has become up. Yes. I say drink a gallon of pure, not tap water a day. A gallon. Take 250 milligrams of vitamin C with those gallons. Uh, you know, like one every three hours. Vitamin C is, is yes. known to kill viruses. And no matter what your doctors, everybody want, makes the, makes you think it's like rust. Cancer is not rust. It's a virus. It's it's living and it's eating. It's not like rust that sits on a bucket and keeps eating away. And they cut it out like rust, too. Mm-hmm. So that's something you should think about, too. And water helps your body be able to fight it and send it out. And vitamin C is just a kick. And if you don't drink enough water, you're going to end up with kidney problems or something or kidney stones. And so you got to drink. It, no matter how much of a pain it is to go, you, what's worse, having cancer and dying of it or having to go pee every 15 minutes? <laughs> Sorry, this is the harsh truth, okay? Yes, it is. Have some prayer teams, uh, you know, pray um, pray with you. Uh, uh, better, uh, you know, I would recommend a healing mass. You can call your local church or diocese or Catholic center and ask them about the healing mass so you can find out when, when this is next. And uh, don't be discouraged if it doesn't work there, and especially immediately. It doesn't happen dramatically like, you know, biblical. Sometimes it might take 90 days and or a year, like it did for one woman who had cataracts, and they uh, disappeared from her. That was an incredible case study. Mm-hmm. Remember that one? Wow. Yeah. yeah, that was great. So say prayers of deliverance for yourself. We would say prayers for deliverance anytime laity does it, and that's it's something simple like, in the name of Jesus Christ, Yep. and, and uh, I rebuke you, spirits of cancer, uh, something along that lines, and say it at least three times. Uh, it's number seven, saying breaking curses prayers, because these can be generational. And they're on our Swords of St. Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, if you go to www.swords of St. Michael, you will find these prayers there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these things are contained in our notes, too. That's what, that's what we love to do. We love to share things mm-hmm. that we know that work, things that we study that work. And, you know, now that we've only got one minute to discuss the film, honey. Oh, we do? Yeah, we've got one minute to discuss the ah, film before we give everybody a break so they can all go to the <laughs> little girls' room and little boys' room. No breaks but you know, them. but but before I do, I have to thank Catherine. I forgot to thank Catherine for supporting our show and sharing our show and everything else. So Catherine, yeah, you, you, you can't kick me now because I mentioned your name, and also too, I want I want to be the first to announce Kenny. Guess guess where we're going October first? No, it's not Disneyland because we don't support Disneyland. Oh, shoot. I know. <laughs> Okay, two guesses. New Star Wars wing is coming in. Oh, please. Like, you, how many times you got to drag me to Star Wars? No, get, okay, you got third guesses, or you know what? You just get the, the rubber October chicken 1st, on the we're going to go hang with uh, Father Bob Bailey and, uh, um, and do a lecture over there in Rhode Island. Oh, well, no, that's this spring. No, 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 no. We're going to go play footsies with our friends in Kentucky. Jim and Sonia are going to, like, slam the cake. And they're going to get married. Bake night. the bomb. Mm-hmm. Yes. Join the hands. Yes. Is that the film? <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Sonia, yes. They're okay. they're they're right going away. to, you know, knock noggins and uh All right, yeah. I'll get graphic now. <laughs> oh please. They're getting married, silly. You're such a boy. Okay, okay, all right. We're gonna take one minute, but you know, because we do have to take a like a four minute break. This film, folks, remember that we watched this film and we were like, Oh my gosh. If you have not seen this film, okay, Ken and I watch Art Brute films to basically look at the differentials and a lot of the common denominators that films have with mental illness and spiritual signs of oppression or possession. This film had a lot of interesting crossover, like Father was talking about. There were certain Mm -hmm. things in this film. It was called The Visit, 2015, by M. Night Shyamalan, which I don't know if many of you know about. But M. Night actually drowned like I did. He actually kept the watch that stopped when he was pulled out of the water and revived as a child. 
So a lot of his imaginings and a lot of his fabulous sense of creativity comes from this great love of life and his wonderful sense of imagination. In this movie called The Visit, you know, it, if you like your humor dark and if you like um, an interesting denouement, uh, it, it is just, it, it's incredible. What it, what struck you about the movie as being similar to um, Possession, Kenny, in The Visit? It's like, what didn't? I know, like, I know, I know. The, well, the first part I could just say is, uh, you know, someone said something the other day about it, too. It's like, if you have 12 o'clock and uh, it's midnight, or especially after 9, and that's when your relative starts to act yes crazy or evil you know yep. or, and the personality totally changes you know i would be leaning towards just a spiritual issue but and that's what was happening there was this uh, woman in the house uh, uh spoilers coming yes in. it's okay spoil it spoil it spoil it and uh she, you know they looked outside the creek you know the visiting grandchildren <laughs> opened the door up and there's grandma you know scratching you hear the, hear the scratching sound no, describe the dog. The, describe the scratching grandma is in a nightgown and nothing else and she's like running her fingernails up and down the wall and it's pitch black all you can see is it just looks moonlight. possessed she you know, looks totally you know. possessed. I mean, I would be calling my priest and grabbing the holy water and dousing her with it if I yeah. saw that in my house. Yeah, and so nighttime when that stuff kicks in and it's an alternate personality, especially a darker one, something about, the, you know, in the night, and that's when the ghosties come out. Well, well not the ghosties necessarily, because <laughs> they don't have to be. Uh, humans don't have to wait for darkness. No, the no, humans they don't. don't either to some degree, you know, depending on And, and that's, that's what the majority of people don't understand. There was a scene, remember that scene where we were like, oh, my gosh, that so acts like a possessed person. Remember when she was on all fours? Yeah. That was truly. That reminds me of one of your experiences. Yes, very very bizarre this happened in the day the kids are underneath what were they doing under the house they're exploring they were playing like hide and seek or something kind of goopy because it has this kind of vast crawl space you know and uh, the dividers it almost looks like you're in some sort of archaeological ruins with uh, a short ceiling and uh, you know low ceiling and pillars and uh, it was under some uh, mansion and uh, and all of a sudden there's this kind of fast crawling by and it turns yes. out to be its grandma you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. That was, well, you know what was bizarre? I okay. freaked out, too. Okay, you know how I like those, uh, who is it Who is it that did the Kill Bill series? Uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the producer. I always wanted to star in one of his movies, but I never got off Broadway, folks. Too bad for me. <laughs> but in this movie... Yeah, this is how the dark humor happens. You see this woman that's acting possessed. She's running around bare need in a in, in what was it? It was like not the basement. It was uh, the crawl space. Yeah, the yeah crawl so she's space, got these yeah. black knees and she's chasing the kids out of the open. This is broad daylight. Her knees are black. They're dirty. Her dress is torn. And then she just brushes herself off. Now this is either mentally ill or possessed. She starts cackling maniacally like ha 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 ha. Brushes herself off and says, "Well, kids." apple pie for dessert and she turns around and flounces up the step and she's half naked and on that note i think it's time to take a break babe <laughs> quentin tarantino thank you jennifer scalsey i love quentin tarantino and now back to father driscoll and we were talking about his book. And where to get it is, uh, well, you can visit PeterInChange.org or Amazon.com, Yes, at, which is where we got it. Um, we Catholic should... Answers Press. Don't forget that when mm -hmm. you're looking right. for that's, this. That's just Catholic.com. Uh, what a great, uh, boy, they got on the ball early, didn't they, Catholic Answers. So Catholic.com yes. is, is their website. Any future books on the horizon? I'm sure there's plenty of things that you got to speak about that, that uh, everybody would love to uh, read. Um, anything have you thought? about writing another book I'm just curious um, yeah I, I've thought of a couple different things and uh, I'd like to do something I'm not sure quite yet what on on uh on, on a Catholic view of mental health, again, like you said, Father Ripperger, he's mm -hmm. written the book on it. Um, it's very big and it's mm -hmm. very deep, and it's the book on the topic. Cause and you, hard to understand, you, Father. Do it anyway. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to do a, a shorter um, <laughs> one with someone, something that my brain can do. And my brain <laughs> and too. Thank you, Father. Yeah, that's, that's what that's I mean. Bring it, to the, bring it to the common and I've man. I've got written some notes. I'd like to do something. You know how we? Uh, this, uh, well, I'm going to say off topic. No, it's not off topic. It's on topic. Yeah. Something yes. on forgiveness. We know how important we are. I say it's important to forgive. Oh, We've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. And when I'm trying to do that, what do I get up in the morning and do? How do I forgive today? And we got to do it every day, just like we've got to be patient and charitable and everything yes. else every day.
day, we've got to be forgiving each day. But I'd like to do one of those like 40 days worth of, of, of thoughts and, and scripture verses on what can I do today to be forgiving? Because that's such a huge part of mental and spiritual health is wow. to forgive. Wow, you know, that's a great things, one. Especially the more, yeah. the more severely someone's been hurt, the harder and yet more important it is to forgive. So that's what I'd like to write right. about. We got that in our Haunted Self-Help Guidebook. We have it in there about forgiving, and then we find out that, uh, you know, rape victims who are more, you know, and there's another example of how it can cripple your psychology, your psychological mind, and it affects your spirit. And then these people oh, often absolutely. can uh, really be affected later on by oppression and stuff because of that one thing that happened to them that, you know, it's like coming back from a war. But, you know, this it reminds me of that, um, that this kind of thing needs yes. to get out. And uh, that would be a great book. And, you know, and the way you write is on the level of, the, and that's what we have to do. We're communicating with everybody. It's We're not very just intelligent talking. and it's yes. very, he talks to the common person. So you're mm -hmm. not talking down to people, Father, and that's a really difficult thing to find in this mm -hmm. line of work if you're like searching. What is What has God got me doing right now? I want to read about this, but I don't know mm -hmm. so your book answers that it answers a need forgiveness is important very much forgive yourself forgive the others like an uh, attack and that would be a good thing i'd point to write to your book i will update our book when we come up with a second edition and say hey this is the book to go to but yeah i'd i'd recommend that you write something like that because that's a big thing and people don't even know it's like i ask myself do i forgive these people who have done something to me you know and i don't want to well, go into it on air but it's like sometimes we don't even know we didn't forgive them Right. I, I think that one of the, well, in, in a nutshell, just again, it, it's never done. Just like being kind or being charitable or being, uh, you know, every one of the virtues we can name yeah. are never having faith. Well, I'm not, I don't say, well, I had faith. I'm done with that. Well, no, I got to have faith again tomorrow. <laughs> Same yeah. thing with forgiving. I've got to be forgiving again tomorrow. So yeah. that, that's, <laughs> that's not meant to be discouraging. It's meant to be encouraging. When yes. someone says, well, I'm still working on it. Of course you are. We're, we're all working mm -hmm. on it every day. So that's okay. Get up tomorrow and again, ask God for the grace to be forgiven of those who have hurt you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for your... Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I, what a great time. Great oh, time my gosh. God bless you. We look forward to having you on again, Father. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the chat room was so excited with all the details. Oh, they were just... Very, oh, thanks to oh everyone in the chat room. They, I'm <laughs> serious. They're <laughs> just like, oh, my gosh, can you suck his brains out any faster? We're not getting enough <laughs> oh. of this man. You know, no, they're just like, oh, nice. my thank gosh. Thank you very much, everyone. And I, yeah, I'll wait to hear from you. I look forward to it. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we're going to uh, wrap it up with a uh, quick detail here. You can get a hold of him at www.peterinchains.org. Father Driscoll, the book Demons, Deliverance, and Discernment by Catholic Answers Press. And if you have any other questions, reach him there. We want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank our sponsors. Yeah. Thank everyone involved in helping us spread the ministry, which is, of course, uh, glory to God, not us here, folks. We are going to mention our website, www www.swordsofstmichael.org that you too can also find some wonderful prayers including our St. Michael prayer, other prayers of liberation and assistance to help you in any spiritual warfare needs you might add and of course we're going to remind you after every program, guess what folks, the battle has been won completely God's beat Satan, alright he's a dog on a leash so don't get too close and Ken and I, we're going to do what we can to help you fight the battle daily God bless each and every one of you. God bless everybody. Amen. Let's uh, rock it out, Kenny, with your rock and roll. Good night from Demonology Today.